get started here? <coughs> we are good. All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the June 14th school committee meeting. Uh, all members are in attendance. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so the first item we have is recognition of our WPS retirees. Thank you, Mr. Ragsdale. Good evening, everyone. Uh, at this time of the year, not only are we preparing to wind down and wrap up a school year, but it also comes with the opportunity and the need to extend our thanks as a school community to those that are set to retire. Uh, from service with the Wilmington Public Schools. Uh, and so uh, this evening <clears throat> at the June 14th meeting, uh, we uh, want to take this opportunity and pause and celebrate our 2022-2023 retirees. This year, our retirees collectively represent, ready for this, 223 combined years of dedication and service to the Wilmington educational community, to the students, our staff, and families collectively. On behalf of our school committee, our families, I would like to take this opportunity to thank them for their service and inspiration to the young people that we serve and wish them nothing but good health and happiness on the next leg of their journey. And if you'll bear with me, I'd like to uh, call those that are able to be in attendance up this evening and also uh, uh, mention the names of those that were unable to attend. Uh, we had uh, the opportunity in the courtyard and moving to the library uh, <laughs> earlier this evening with the school committee to uh, have some informal conversation and chat with those in attendance and um, we want to uh, again acknowledge them this evening so uh, if I may uh, call them up to ask and then the intent was to have them remain standing correct right I think so um, so first off we'll start with uh, Dana Burnham uh, from the district from our uh, information technology office data assistance retiring with 12 years of service Dana if you would mind coming up Susan McDonald uh, West Intermediate District and our ESL teacher as well as CTL with 17 years of service. Next up, uh, Marilyn Ganeras, North Intermediate Educational Assistant with 34 years of service. Karen Boudreau, Woburn Street, Cafeteria Manager with 24 years of service. And finally, Jean Shabilia from Woburn Street Food Service Staff, 23 years of service. Please join me in giving our thanks to them. For their <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, just very briefly, uh, those that uh, we also want to congratulate and wish well and thank them for their service here to Wilmington, but unable to attend this evening. Justine Palermo from the Wilmington Middle School, administrative assistant with 23 years of service. Uh, Marjorie Malone from uh, the Middle School, educational assistant with 18 years. Linda Spinazzola from the middle school as well, math strategy teacher with 22 years. Trish Moulton from West Intermediate, grade five teacher, 17 years. Lisa Dooling, West Intermediate, educational assistant with six years. Diane Harvey from the high school, educational assistant with 21 years. And finally, Leslie uh, Parsley Butwell, part-time food services with six years. Again, congratulations to all those and nothing but good luck, health, and happiness in your years ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have senior exploration presentation. Uh, so we have Mr. Gendron and WHS seniors. All right. Yep. Hello, everyone. And in fact, I'm just going to introduce uh, senior exploration. Yeah. So we have a couple students here to talk about um, what they did during their senior exploration. So this is something that happens every year um, at the end of quarter four. So seniors leave the high school early and classes end early so that they can complete a project or an internship. And this start the process starts at the beginning of the year. They start talking with their counselors and brainstorming ideas of what they're going to do, start looking for internships and kind of create a plan about what's going to happen. And then... Um, about midway through quarter four, senior exploration starts, and 
the project is kind of an opportunity for students who have a lot of AP classes and still have to go to those to have like something more time flexible and then an internship is an opportunity for students to like go in and work with a company and basically for people to get an idea of maybe practice with a career they're interested in or just a time to really devote to a project that they're really interested in that maybe time they wouldn't have had otherwise because of school or work or other things. So um, we have people here with very different projects that kind of give you an example of what this is like and what this opportunity entails. So first we have Grace Smith with her project. Where am I going? Right here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, so, welcome. Thank you. Um, my project, I want to go into the health field. And as someone who's 18 and not even had graduated high school at the time, it is very hard to find a internship where you can actually go in and deal with something in the medical field because you're just not in a position where you can do that. You're young, you're not trusted, and there's a bunch more people in college or who are like working towards something in the medical field that need that internship more than you. So I decided to focus on something that I genuinely had a passion for. And what I did was I hiked over all of Massachusetts and I focused on public health. So how I did this, if you're looking and saying, oh, she just went and hiked for her project, it was more than that. <laughs> um, I got into this with my mom at a really young age and I, it was really just something for me to go out there and like help people find access to something they have in the yard. Like a lot of people don't know what's around them and a lot of the times, at least for me as someone who's genuinely struggled with like joint issues and had older parents who like want to go out with them but like can't do the same things I can do, sometimes we try to go to a trail and you just, you don't know what it's going to be like when you get there. You don't know if your GPS is going to bring you to the right place. You don't know if it's going to be like a paved trail. You don't know if it's going to be really rooted or if it's going to be flooded or you don't know what you're going to expect. So I made this site to basically be a place where you can just go and you can look up a hike that I've already done. You can click on it, you can see where it is, you can get directions, you can see pictures of it, and you can see points on accessibility. I had a brief blurb, if you hit the maps and trails, um, just click that button and scroll down, you'll see maps that I did. This first map is interactive, so if you click on that, it'll show you a large map that is interactive where you can scroll around and look at all the hikes I did. So I hiked, I very specifically broadened my project because I didn't want to focus on just Middlesex County. I didn't want to stay here because I, <laughs> I knew that this project was a large amount of space for me in a time that I wouldn't have normally to go and just explore all of Massachusetts. So the second map back on the website is a map of all the counties in Massachusetts. And I was able to hike every county but four, um, the obvious ones as the two islands, Duke and Nantucket, and then Barnstable and I forget the name of the other one, but I basically spent most of my days driving around, researching hikes, reading, and just going places, hiking, taking pictures. A lot of part, it wasn't just hiking for this project for me, it was also learning how to use the tools to make an interactive map, attach it to a website, make a website, and just like, I'm not a photographer, I do different types of art. So it was, it was just learning how to adapt all of these tools and put them all here. So for me, it was just a way to take something I'm very passionate for and put it into a website. So if you scroll into like, behold hold over the maps, if you hover over it, you will see, uh, not that map, <laughs> the maps and trail button in the top corner. If you hover over that, you'll see all of the counties. And you can click on each county. And if you click on each county, it will show you a brief summary of each county. It'll show you all the hikes I did, a picture of the county and all the towns in it, and then just a bunch of pictures of what you might encounter. So it will something to like entice you and be like, oh, this is around me. This is in my backyard. I can go to this. So you might go out there and do it. And then if you hover over the maps and trails again, and you hit the small arrow next to any given county, it will expand and it will show you all the hikes that are done in that county and you can click on every one of those. And it will show you a main cover picture, a location with a map, a brief information, and things about its accessibility. Like this one says it's extremely well marked. It's a pretty tame trail, not too rooted or rocky. There's lots of bridges, because I like bridges. Um, it's GPS arrives at the entrance. There's no parking, so there's only street parking. It's not a populated trail and it's dog friendly, because that's something that genuinely concerns me. If I go somewhere, I don't know if I'm paying 10 bucks, I don't know if my dog can even be there. So it's something that I know people are gonna wanna know. Thank you. Thanks. Fantastic. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so next we have Elizabeth Hayda presenting her mural project. I can sit first and then I'll um, walk over <laughs> and I'll show you things. So for my senior project, I chose to do like a mural painting. Um, 
I want to go into engineering, clearly. You see the relation, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm also really um, interested in design and potentially pursuing that as a career path. But I have spent a lot of time in the art department here at WHS. Um, it's been a really valued part of my high school education. And I've learned a lot about creativity and identity and expression and confidence, and especially in my portfolio class this year, which is like a very, like an independent kind of self-directed art class. I spent a lot of time exploring like style, um, personal style and artistic vision and stuff, and I kind of wanted to carry that into my projects. So I kind of took this time as an excuse to just paint all day, which is pretty much what I did for like three weeks straight. Mm -hmm. I woke up, I painted, probably ate a few meals and then went to bed and I did it all over again. <laughs> Um, so this mural is for WHS. Um, I kind of wanted to embody like the spirit of education and exploration and all the different things you can learn while you're here. Um, and also kind of just enrich the school's like culture um, and just promote support for the arts because I have very much um, been able to take advantage of that and appreciate all the opportunities WHS has afforded me in the visual arts. Um, I think the process was much bigger than just painting. There was a lot of planning um, and design and detail-oriented stuff that I personally really enjoyed. I spent a lot of time figuring out the materials I needed and the order in which I should paint and layer. Um, spent a lot of time experimenting with different techniques for uh, achieving different um, looks, different textures, and so I kind of I got to develop a lot of more like knowledge um, about art, but also uh, really focus on like self-discipline was a big part of this, um, setting goals for each day, you know, learning to kind of go with the flow when it came to like experimentation and frustration when things went wrong and kind of being able to overcome those. So overall, I'm very happy with how it turned out mm -hmm. and I'm very grateful for the experience because I've learned a lot about art and everything that goes on behind the piece itself. So I can walk over now and just show you like a little bit um, of the painting itself because there's quite a few like personal touches um, and, and different meanings that I kind of wove in. So. <coughs> I can move it. Why don't I just have this So it all goes together. Um, and I kind of just painted it all at once, so I could do like individual panels. So um, each of like the little different like planets and areas are kind of different subjects of school, and all together they come to you know make a big gap, which I, which I thought was very fitting for talking about senior exploration and all the possibilities for where you can go in and after high school, um, which is where I'm currently at. So this first part over here is kind of like social studies and history um, and like that department. So there's like a little clock and a compass. Um, here's the globe and little people and just fun little details that are kind of, those are more put in at the end. Um, <laughs> this is like the math area. Um, this was, here's like the Fibonacci sequence which is something that I really had fun with in art. It's a mathematical sequence, but it's often found um, in the natural world and in art pieces. So I thought that was kind of like a fun little interdisciplinary like touch. Um, and then this is uh, more constellations, but it's my um, astrological sign. <laughs> it's cancer. <laughs> so I got to put some fun things in there. Like these binary numbers here are uh, like translations of like my birthday and my student code. And, um, <laughs> opportunities where I, I needed, you know, I needed some zeros and ones, so I was like, how can I make this a little more personal and have some fun with it? Um, 
over here. This is like the science planet. Um, a lot of these are things that I got to explore in my time at WHS um, with all the different science classes. So there's um, like physics and nuclear physics. This um, is like a reference to the rainbows, a reference to like optics, which was one of my favorite units in physics this year. Um, there's biological sciences, environmental sciences, and chemistry. Um, over here, this is like literature and languages. So there's like different languages and books and fun kind of whimsical um, sides of, of literature, maybe fantasy or older literature and things that you might study in school. Um, this is like music. I'm also a violinist as well as an artist. And this here is um, actually an excerpt, a few bars from the piece Mars from the Planets by Holmes. I don't know if you've ever heard it. But I actually played that in my um, youth orchestra, uh, I think in my sophomore year. So um, I, I enjoyed returning to that. And then this is like a paintbrush and just references to the Starry Night paintings by Van Gogh. So yeah, these are just a, f just a few of the little different details. Um, I, I had a lot of fun with the little things. I think at first I had to do like all the black painting and then go in with the galaxy and do sponges to create this effect. And that was a big, long process of the same thing over and over again. And that was a challenge because it was a little exhausting. But once I got into doing these like little creative touches and a lot of the fine work and the fine line work, uh, that was what I most enjoyed. So that kind of showed me maybe a little bit that I'm very interested in like detail-oriented planning and artistic design. So I, I got a lot of useful um, lessons out of it. But I also have a very beautiful finished piece that I'm very pleased with. And I hope that it will be in the school. It will kind of create this very artistic um, vibe and, and environment to encourage students in the future to uh, seriously embrace art um, at, uh, during their high school. Uh, that was my project. Um, hopefully, it will be enjoyed for many years in the future. Thank you. Okay, and finally, we have Thomas Sika to talk about his internship. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm not sure how to follow up. <laughs> <laughs> definitely didn't make anything along any of the lines of that, but um, I decided for my senior exploration project to do an internship. Um, I found that when choosing between to do a project or an internship, I was much more intrigued in actually getting out there and applying myself to what it is I want to do in college, and I want to go to physical therapy in college. Um, so I reached out to a bunch of places, you know, family, friends, heard about these places. Um, and I ended up with Fitzgerald Physical Therapy. Um, so I was, you know, I was expecting the worst and that I was simply gonna be essentially the bus boy there, doing, <laughs> things, doing small tasks, but I was, you know, I was hoping I would get some involvement in the field that I was gonna be going into. Um, started there and immediately off the bat, two things stick, stuck out to me. Uh, one, their mission is not just fixing an issue that you have, it was improving your quality of life. We saw people come in of all different varieties with all different types of issues and life stories as to what happened to them. Um, and the team not only worked to simply fix it, but help understand with the patient and understand themselves where they're coming from, their difficulties, other than the injury that are preventing them from getting better or um, just progressing in general. Um, so I learned that immediately. And throughout that, they did a fantastic job in including me in Every patient that I was able to get to, uh, showing me, you know, if there's a problem in spot A, you don't just focus on spot A. You have to focus on spots B through D, because it'll work the, around spot A. Um, and they did a great job of doing that. Showed me how to properly do specific exercises that they were doing with uh, specific patients. Um, and then just the environment was extremely friendly. But what was great about it is that it gave me some exposure to what I'm going in for college. It made me sure about what it, I am you know, spending my money on for the next four <laughs> years and then some. Um, and that was extremely, extremely important. And it got to the point where I wasn't just the bus boy. Uh, you know, I was cleaning for a couple days, but after you know, they realized that I wanted to be there, I wanted this exposure, um, it got to the point I was doing um, specifically ACL tear um, patients, their visits, 
Um, I would do the exercise with them with a little bit of guidance and a little bit of supervision, but for the most part, they trusted me because they had shown me and given me enough exposure to be able to handle these situations on my own. Um, and I was, you know, it, it felt as if I was already in the career because they were giving me such an uh, open area to explore and learn from all of them and did a great job teaching me. Um, I think that's a very beneficial process to choosing, you know, an internship specifically just because I did it, I have a bias behind that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, going in for college, you may have never experienced what you're majoring in. Um, and I think that it's very important to put yourself out there to see if it's right for you before getting in there, if you want to um, get on the right path as soon as possible. And I think this was a great, uh, uh, it was something that was great for me to be able to get that for me and uh, get that going. And yeah, so thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Yeah, uh, are there any questions or comments from the committee? Mrs. Burns? I just would like to say that I think this is, if I can recall correctly, and it's a little late, um, one of the first, first times that we've heard from the variety of seniors um, and, and their senior projects and, and what it encompassed. And, what a wonderful opportunity, an absolutely wonderful opportunity, especially where it lands um, in their senior year. And I, I think it's absolutely fantastic. And just listening, just the presentation, the articulation, the in detail how, well, just the quality level. I know that when I was a senior, I'm, I could be a fan of photography, but I know I didn't have that shading expertise when I was a senior, but um, it's it's just a wonderful avenue for exploration of one's own self and um, one's future. Because I know I remember when I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up, but <laughs> but but good for you. And, and your hard work is is you know is is completely evident. Um, and and I thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you so very much. Other comments or questions? And Go just ahead. to add one thing on that note, like um, I think intrinsic motivation is something that we're constantly trying to develop in students. I think you just heard that. Mm -hmm. um, and while these three, four are fantastic and awesome, like there's dozens of students who could have come in and sat here tonight and delivered like an outstanding experience, um, which is incredible. Uh, and I just want to reiterate kind of like what you just heard is the vision of the graduate and both at the proposal phase of this senior exploration and the conclusion, the students themselves s submit like a summary of how they demonstrated those five mindsets throughout this experience. So uh, I think definitely what you said about capturing the graduate, 100%. Um, could I, do we do a, uh, I know in some school districts and granted uh, Rhode Island is where my, I'm most familiar, they do um, senior exploration project, almost like not a contest, but sort of like a presentation, you know, before parents and, you know, faculty and, and the community. Is that ever, has that been done here or it has? Yep, so the sorry, project. I missed, my, I missed the boat, obviously. The projects <laughs> present uh, in small groups in front of uh, a small group of classmates and teachers and administrators. Okay. Um, so like in an hour window, we go through four projects and they stay to be each other's audience. The internships happen on a one-day expo in the gym where all of the internships present and the community comes and kind of circulates through. Because I think it would be, it would be great, um, to, even for the, the smaller components, to be brought forth to the, the wider community. Um, you know, I, I, I just think it's a, it's, a, it's a great showcase about what is actually truly going on um, within, our, uh, within our high school and where our seniors, you know, the... Uh, what they had. I mean, granted, it may need to be broken down um, in, you know, timely for timeliness sake, but um, I, I just, I do think that, I think it'd be a wonderful, I, I would love, I mean, this is fabulous. I, we don't have all the time tonight, but I would love to hear more about um, how students have uh, intro, intro, have it pushed themselves to explore <laughs> um, their world in, in their futures in, in education, in, in, you know, in this realm. So, thank you. Just a quick follow-up on that, just perhaps WCTV could do something, and maybe they do something like highlights of, um, to, and, and that could be a way to, A, present the community, but also preserve it uh, for future years. I think that, that could be a really good way to capture it, because they are fan fantastic, and, and they do cover such a wide range of topics. It is, it is really good. 
Mr. Smaha? Um, the other thing I just might want to add on to that as well is, if, I guess the question is, are there opportunities for 9, 10, and 11th graders to see what the seniors um, have done so that'll get them sort of going to? Does that happen? Yeah, so they come to the internship expo, um, not the project presentations, which is an opportunity uh, to connect, um, but definitely something we can expand on too. Dr. Bryson? So I think what we're all saying is this is just truly awesome and unbelievable. And we're like, oh my gosh, how do we, what else is out there that we don't know? So kudos to you and your team. I, we are just beyond impressed, clearly, that we just want to know more and see more. Mm -hmm. um, is there a catalog? How do, I guess who keeps track? Who is the mastermind checking all these things off at so, high school? So this year it was certainly Mr. Staff here. Okay. Uh, he attended every presentation um, that went on um, and the internship. Um, we use Google Classroom for the first year to digitize as much of this as possible. Uh, so all the forms, all the checkpoints um, were communicated through Google Classroom. But it is a pretty intense undertaking. Uh, and we're looking at opportunities to kind of spread that load across not only administrators, but also um, teachers um, to try to make sure that it's as supportive, um, kind of full school effort as possible. But kudos to Mr. Staff here. Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> Can I add something? Is that okay? Yes, please. All right. Can I come over to the mic? I have two please. things. One, um, I have some goodies here. Uh, <laughs> I had to represent, um, now that I'm working for the company that I had the internship for, so I promised them that I would get some publicity out of here. But uh, <laughs> I'll, leave these, I'll leave these up front. Um, there's some water bottles. Right there. <laughs> is, this, is this part of your grade? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he's graduated. <laughs> There's, there may be a common misconception behind this that we're just getting out a month early um, and that the, the, the students aren't actively learning in this month period. But um, I would say that this month, not saying that, you know, the other 12 years <laughs> school that you're learning are not important, very, very important. But this month, it, as I said, it, it gives you a, a clear indication to a field that you could be going into um, in a way that you may not have ever explored with the other 12 years of learning. Um, and so I would say this month is definitely still learning in its highest capacity um, for young adults who are going into college and entering into the workforce. So I think it is very important for this to continue and to be uh, monopolized, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So cool. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, another round of <laughs> Okay, next we have our consent agenda, and the first item is approval of minutes from the May 24th, 2023 regular session. So do I have a motion? Motion by Mr. Fennelly, second by Ms. Burns. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Uh, with the consent of the committee, um, I would like to pass over item B, and uh, Dr. Brand, can you speak to that? Uh, sure, I, I try here. Um, yeah, the, uh, the New York trip uh, information was uh, in your packet for the New York City Band and Orchestra trip. Uh, with a uh, discussion with the chair, the recommendation here would be to pass over this for this evening to gather a little bit more information that uh, arguably should have been included in your packet, and that's my, that's my oversight. Uh, but to bring this back to you in September, and I will work with Mr. Ferrer to try and shore up that information with you. I've confirmed that there's no issue in delaying it until September, so that won't have any um, impact negatively on the trip and the plans that have to ensue. So if there's no objection, then we will move to item D, warrants. So we have General 49, Revolving 53, 54, 55, and 56, Local 87, 88, 89, 90, and 91, Food Service 62, 63, 64, and 65. Do we have a motion? Motion by Mrs. Burns, second by Mr. Samaha. All in favor? It's unanimous. Uh, next is payroll for June 7th, 2023. I have a motion to approve. Motion by Mr. Fennelly, second by Mr. Turner. All in favor? And that is unanimous. 
Uh, and then we have Warren's uh, special education 56, 57, 58, and 59. I have a motion by Mr. Fennelly, second by Mr. Samaha. Um, all in favor? And that is everyone except an abstention from Ms. Burns. Oh, and. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Only kidding, we're done. And jumping back to item C, which was always the plan to do it in this order. Um, we have approval of the Wilmington Education Foundation Technology Grants, uh, 19 grants totaling $23,530. And Mr. Fennelly, could you read the recipients? Happily taking over uh, for Mr. Ragsdale, who used to read all these. I won't read the entire uh, list because it is, uh, as, uh, as David said, 19 grants totaling $23,530.05, but I will say, uh, as always, thank you to WEF for their continued support, and congratulations to, and forgive me if I mispronounce any names, Mike Sudak from Shawsheen, Amanda Salerno from the high school, Jill Reynolds and Kate Pasternak from the north, Alyssa Rasso from the Boutwell, Kimberly Provencal from uh, WPS, uh, where am I? Kelly Manorino from the Wildwood, Michelle McDonald from the Woburn Street, Sean Lebrun from the high school, Michelle Kirkchen from the West, Ed Kaiser and Charles Ronchetti from the middle school, Kerry French from the Wildwood, Paula Doherty from Shoshin, Robin Barry from the North, Suzanne Krull from Woburn Street, Elena Jewett from the Shawsheen, Lauren Bissett from the North, Leah Allen from the Shawsheen, and Samantha Onesimo from the North. Congratulations and thank you again to WEF. And thank you to those educators for researching these technology products and applying for the grants and for the generosity of WEF. It said, I don't know if we need a motion, but I would move to approve uh, the WEF grants in the amount of $23,530.05. I'll second that. All right, motion by Mr. Fennelly, second by Ms. Burns. All in favor? And that is unanimous. All right, that brings us to our superintendent's report. Dr. Gray. Thank you. Uh, good evening again. Uh, just three items uh, with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, items that are included in the packet and will go in order tonight. First off, you know, we continue to try and bring um, uh, great recognition to this fine institution, uh, the Wilmington Public Schools, and more specifically as of late, at this time of the year, the Wilmington High School. Uh, thanks to the support of our school counseling uh, office here and specifically Ms. Dickerson who works very closely with Ms. Ingersoll, kudos to both of them for producing the uh, the document that's included in the packet and that we have sent out to our community, the Class of 2023 Achievements. This is a new endeavor started I think a year, maybe, maybe two years ago now, um, but just an opportunity to uh, bring focus to the amazing accomplishments in a concise uh, document uh, and we're so proud of these. We have 12, as you'll see in this uh, brochure, uh, 12 uh, current Wilmington High School students that are going on to continue their uh, involvement in collegiate activity. Um, uh, a variety of colleges. Uh, we have um, also, as you can see, class members from this graduating class have been accepted to 198 schools and have chosen a long list of 76 that they'll be attending and we've tried our best not to miss one of those uh, institutions there of uh, higher education uh, that these students will pursue. Uh, also a shout out to nine students that are planning to pursue uh, education as a field of study, two students that are enlisting in the armed forces and seven that are entering a trade. So uh, again, just an opportunity to bring great attention and focus to the many accomplishments of our uh, graduating class of 2023. Um, with that, I mean, I'll we can move on. Okay. Uh, with that, I'll turn over to uh, Ms. Elliott for the next item, uh, new CTL. Sure. Good evening. So um, just a few moments ago, we said goodbye to um, Susan McDonald as she retires, and I am announcing that we um, have hired someone to fulfill her really large shoes um, for, this, uh, for the fall. So we are excited to announce that uh, Ms. Colleen Billings will be joining us as our next ESL curriculum team leader and teacher. 
Um, she currently serves as the English Learner Education Program Coordinator for the Andover Public Schools. She has an extensive background um, in English Learner Education, Bilingual Education, Professional Development, SEI, Grant Writing, and Educational Leadership. She um, has been um, a teacher of um, uh, EL teacher for, for many, many years as well. She's co-authored a book. Um, she's a lot of experience with writing Title III grants. Uh, we are very fortunate to have her joining us um, as of July 1 officially. She came in last week to um, uh, shadow Mrs. McDonald and um, interact with students and is um, clearly very fluent in Spanish, which came in really handy, and it was a great, oftentimes people have that listed in school spring, uh, they are fluent in a language, but we really got to see that she was fluent in the language. Um, but it was exciting to have her, and we'll look forward to her um, seeing more of her as she transitions here, so. Great. Um, th I just need a wave for Paul. <laughs> He's helping me out. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, and last, uh, le thank you, Ms. Elliott. Um, we have uh, two uh, flyers that are in the packet uh, for fan <laughs> What is going on? Are we on? I don't know. <laughs> Circus. Uh, we, we are uh, thankful for, uh, for our family engagement specialists and so thankful for our collective decision and your support to continue with uh, their involvement in our, in our district. Uh, two, um, two announcements to bring focus to uh, for summer learning, if you will. The first uh, on June 27th, uh, social emotional summer learning program uh, that will be presented by our family engagement specialists. Um, and as well, uh, with a date still to be announced, but closer to the beginning of school, a back to school executive functioning refresher. I can confirm that both of these, the plans are for both of these to be recorded. They're, they're being held uh, virtually, and both of these will be recorded and made available for, uh, for community members who can't attend um, uh, when, when, they're, when they're offered. So some good things, I think, uh, that uh, are, are planned already for the summer, and uh, again, we'll make sure that these are widely publicized for members of our community. So I, just a couple of comments. So on celebrating the good, I, I really have to say how much I've enjoyed the, the format. I, thought, I think it was a very exciting uh, PDF that you shared with, with us. And I, I don't really recall, um, we've got two students going abroad for further uh, education, which I think is absolutely fascinating uh, because that's a huge step um, to not to go to college, but to do so abroad. Um, and um, it's just, I think it just speaks to the volume of, um, and piggybacks as what Mr. Gendrum in the, in the senior presentation um, uh, shows of our, our students in their, when they get to this stage in their educational career. And um, I also um, very happy with regards to the family engagement specialist workshops, uh, especially the uh, back to school refresher, because I think um, not only for students to get back in that train of organization and ready to learn, but I think it would really come as a huge benefit for families to, after summer vacation um, to get back into that, also in that structure to support their students um, uh, entering into our school. So um, I, I applaud um, both of these, uh, these measures and these uh, uh, topics. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions, Mr. McCauley? Yeah, I just had a comment on the, um, the you know, showing the good and everything. And I just have to say, very impressive list of schools there that I think a lot of the kids are going to. Um, I think it speaks to a lot of the work that the district has done here over the years. So I think it's really great. Uh, Mr. Smaha. Yeah, again, with the, with the good, I just wanted to um, uh, point out um, it's a fantastic list of schools. But I also really enjoyed seeing that bottom section, where it includes the armed forces um, and the trades, which are just as important as college. Mm -hmm. So I happy to see that. Thank you. I wasn't going to say anything because I already complimented mm -hmm. this beautiful um, flyer earlier, which I think I believe it was Tracy who put this together. Is that correct? correct? So thank you, Tracy. Thank you. It was <laughs> lovely. Um, and to just reinforce what you've just said. I felt the same way. I felt looking at this that it was really inclusive um, of, of our community and I was happy to see that, that we weren't just highlighting one particular group of students right. but we were highlighting all of our students. So so thank you and thank you for making it look so yep. lovely. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, that brings us to new business and um, 
If there's no objection, I would like to take um, item C first um, so that we can um, get Mr. Gendron <laughs> uh, up um, for the first reading of the high school handbook. Um, does anyone object to moving that to first in order? All right, then please come up, Mr. Gendron. All right. Good evening, everyone. Hello again. Good evening. <laughs> uh, and so for this item, uh, hopefully you received the memo uh, summarizing the legal and operational changes uh, proposed in this year's handbook. Um, I know we were waiting on the legal uh, recommendations to come back, uh, and they came back very recently. So um, hopefully that summary was helpful. Um, the first meeting that I came to or listened to was around this process last year. Uh, and so I know there was some feedback about working to make the handbook a more manageable document. Uh, certainly some of these additions uh, recommended by the attorney uh, extends the document, but um, <laughs> you know, we're yes, working. Um, and we did make some uh, consolidations um, that have tried to make it more wieldy. Um, but uh, I'm happy to answer or elaborate any questions uh, or any of those proposed changes. Ms. Burns. Um, I, I had a question with regards to the um, senior final exemption policy. It, says, it states that it's been removed, understandably. Is there, now, is there the, this expectation, is that, is that no longer in the handbook for seniors, or does it become just, I, I'm just curious as to what, how seniors and their families knew with regards to the change in this and how, uh, what the expectation is, I guess. Yep, so that is a very complicated policy, so I'll try to kind of streamline things. This proposal would be to remove the policy, which would be saying that all seniors are taking uh, final exams, both at the mid-year point for their first semester finals. Mm -hmm. um, the senior final exemption policy originally started as like a fourth quarter thing. Mm -hmm. Prior to senior exploration, it was a way to motivate or reward students who went four quarters, maintain a 90% average, no unexcused absences or problems, and have teacher uh, approval. Mm -hmm. Since senior exploration, the final exams at the end of the year, they're now happening during the third and fourth quarter. It's not a separate week. So it's almost like the year-end finals, which that policy was designed to address, those don't happen anymore mm -hmm. uh, in the same way. Okay. Um, at the mid-year point, for those first semester electives, there is a final at the mid-year point. Um, and I was really startled uh, when a lot of conflict started to happen over exemptions from those finals. Um, I think a couple things you need to know. One, uh, for the grade distribution of seniors in quarter one, 74% of senior quarter one grades were A minus or above. So rather than this policy referring to a very small number of students, it's the vast majority that are academically eligible for an exemption. In quarter two, it was 68%. Uh, further concerning, we observed that that grading distribution of like really the vast majority of students exceeding expectations doesn't hold up in any other measures. It doesn't hold up in our own midterm and final performance. It doesn't hold up in SAT performance or AP performance. Um, and so it seems almost like our quarter grades are exceptionally high, mm -hmm. uh, making almost everyone eligible for this exemption as long as someone at home can write in a note that excuses all the absences. So around that mid-year point, we got a flood of absence notes for unexcused absences throughout the year. The Ooh. handbook says those should come in within a week. And so we were saying to families, like, no, those, those absences aren't excused. Uh, and for the first time, I think that, like, I think in the past it was much more lenient. Yeah. Um, and just kind of like everyone was excused. And so I think as we think about, like, increasing ac academic expectations, preparing students um, for post-secondary success, mm -hmm. uh, and we take four school days where we don't have class, we have assessments, mm -hmm. the students should be taking assessments at that time. Uh, and so while I understand the intent of this policy when it happened, mm -hmm. things have changed uh, pretty significantly. Um, and so I think that's kind of the context, okay. the short version. Um, you know, the priorities, higher academic expectations, 
addressing that disproportionate grade distribution, reducing unnecessary conflicts with students and families. Um, and, and I would just say that addressing that grade distribution, this policy alone is not the answer. There's a lot of other work we're doing with students uh, and curriculum to address that. Um, it does mean that more students will be taking exams during those times, um, which I know uh, might not be popular, uh, especially with the rising seniors. Um, the school advisory council was really helpful, a, a group that has students on it. Uh, and around December, they were not terribly supportive of taking those exams. They said that, you know, it was nice to have a break, uh, to have kind of like a week off before the week off. Um, but towards the end of the year, um, they were supportive of this being part of us really preparing our students for life after high school. Um, we looked at alternatives, changing the threshold to 95% instead of 90, removing the unexcused absence. Uh, and, and to quote one of the students, the recommendation was to rip the Band-Aid off um, <laughs> and, and to kind of move on from this particular policy. So uh, that's, um, I think, Ms. Burns, part of your question was, how will people know? We haven't announced anything yet because it's not approved yet. Right. Um, but that will be part of like our end of year wrap up, preview into next year communications, and our opening of school communications that we send to students and families. Okay. If approved. Thank you very yeah, much. Sorry for the long winded. No, no, but I think it. Uh, I think it, um, it, it. For me, anyway, it, it did require a little bit more clarification as to how this was going to gel and the circumstances on the whys and hows and, um, you know, I, I thank you for that because that clarification was very helpful. Um, just regarding the final exam policy, does this at all change the policy with AP classes where those don't typically have final exams? No. Nope. So again, like that, as of now, the end of year exams, which typically happen during that quarter three, quarter four, last kind of phase in your classes, no intent to change that. Uh, I think in full transparency, there are some people who are interested in expanding senior exploration to the full fourth quarter which might then lend itself to kind of like a final exam period, but that's not something that's being implemented or proposed at this time. Okay. So I, thank you for this. I have, I think, maybe more of a comment than a question, um, and I may be the only one up here who feels this way, but I love the, the table in the memo that sort of explains everything. My personal preference for first read would be to see the handbook in almost like a track changes, so I can say, oh, on page 17, we added language. What did it say before? What does it say now? So I can kind of see what, the, what it was, at least for the first read, and then when it comes back as a second read, it's a clean version, and I kind of know where everything is. But, I mean, if nobody else feels that way, I'll, I'll deal with it myself. But uh, aside from that, I think it's great. I think all the changes seem to make sense. Um, I appreciate you bringing it to us. Mr. Turner. I, I I will second what Mr. Conway said. Red line is easy. It's something, something that's an easy way to track these sorts of things. But the table is super helpful, too. But um, with regard to W-2 and the changes there, is that the first step in a process you feel, or is that kind of where you think that's headed? I mean, it, it doesn't go to a great deal in the handbook, but where do you, where do you feel like we are with, with W-2 and, and how that's evolving? Yep. So um, I think, I guess, two things. And Audrey... Uh, we weren't here for the whole pilot, but we piloted a new scheduling software this year. Um, I think at the beginning of the year, we did some scheduling survey, and the feedback from students and staff was that W-2 was helpful and meaningful time, but that it wasn't necessarily being executed well. Uh, we didn't have a scheduling software for flex time, uh, and so we were trying to use like our hallway pass system to, to make passes, and it was really not effective because that tool is not meant for that. Uh, so this spring we piloted a tool that's meant for flex time in school. Uh, we took the 84-minute block and split it up into two schedulable sections. Uh, so every day a student's location and which teacher they're working with can change. A teacher has first priority if they have a struggling student that they need to book uh, for a period of time. Uh, otherwise, students have uh, the opportunity uh, to decide which teacher they need to spend time with. Uh, that is, I think, the most effective model of flex time in school that I've seen. Um, I think uh, that software, the pilot, um, seems to have gone well, a little bit of adjusting, but it's really cut down on kind of 
uncontrolled movement throughout the building, uh, which is both a, an instructional priority but also a safety concern. So I think that is the direction. Uh, I know in the proposed schedule that we studied, uh, it ex explored going from a seven class schedule, which we have now, so students take four classes on blue days and three plus W2 on white days. It looked at taking the 84 minutes of W2, which currently falls on one day, and distributing, distributing it across both days. Um, in doing that, you would add uh, an extra class on the white day. So it would be four classes in W2 on blue day, four classes in W2 on white day. Um, but it, it didn't feel like at that time adding a course and like there's a lot that goes to that. Um, it didn't feel like something we were prepared to do. Uh, but I would say it is relevant in how we think about W2 um, because I think whether it should occur every day for an extended period, every other day for a long time, or every day for a shorter time is I think something we'll need to continue to wrestle with. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Other, uh, looks like we have no other questions here. Uh, this is just our first read, um, so this will come back to us at the June 28th meeting and uh, we will look at it again there. If I just may, one just quick comment on the red line um, uh, and appreciate the feedback. We, we debated about, um, uh, to be uh, fair, we debated about whether or not to include that um, in, in this version. There was, a, there was a lot of messiness with the, um, the council's review and, and, and such, and so uh, it was my thought that at the end, this should serve and can serve as a baseline, if you will, you know, with Mr. Gendron's first pass at this handbook is his handbook. Uh, I think that we, we can and should consider this, that baseline, and from here forward, we certainly can include both the table to highlight as well as the red line track changes. I think that'll be easier. It's reasonable. I, I would appreciate that. That would be helpful. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jenner. All right, thank you. All right, thank very you. Much. <laughs> and, and good night. You can go. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> you may depart. Uh, all right, that brings us to uh, MSBA Wildwood, and we have a presentation from our team at Dora Whittier and SMMA, Dr. Brand. Sure, thank you. Um, this is uh, our uh, guests are, are making their way to the table. So uh, you know that this has been, of course, a considerable focus of our attention, our community, and our leadership board's attention recently. Uh, we've talked about this, of course, with this, uh, this group as well, too. Um, following, uh, and this is for more of the audience at home that might be watching, uh, following a recent meeting uh, at the end of May, I think it was May, May 31st, um, we, uh, we held a, um, a, a multi-board meeting uh, that included both the school committee here, uh, the finance committee, select board, as well as the Wildwood Building Committee uh, to deliver information and an update on where uh, where things stand with regards to the uh, RMSBA project that is, of course, as you all know, um, closely connected to the Wildwood School. We, um, we have been working, when I, we have a leadership group that is now up and running, and this leadership group includes uh, Town Manager uh, Hall, George Hooper, Paul Ruggiero, and myself, and along now with um, the, uh, both our uh, owner's project manager, who is uh, SMMA and Julie LaDuke uh, here this evening, uh, as well as our design firm, Doran Whittier, also here this evening. I'll turn it over to them in just a moment. Uh, Doran Whittier and SMMA were, uh, have been hired by the community of Wilmington to partner with the town and obviously the school district uh, to uh, engage in the development of what will be a forthcoming either new construction or possible renovation to the Wildwood School. You know that we submitted uh, uh, multiple statement of interest to the MSBA uh, a number of months, a number of years now back, uh, but we are at a, a juncture in which uh, we are readying to press go, readying to move forward, if you will. Um, but just before doing so, uh, it is that internal leadership group's belief, working alongside of SMMA and Doran Whittier, uh, that we wanted to bring some, I think, very timely and important information to all four boards and all, all of the community. Tonight, uh, they are here to walk you through the same presentation that earlier this week has been shared with the board of select, uh, the select board, sorry, as well as the finance committee, and with that will be shared with the Wildwood Building Committee that will be scheduled to meet next week. Um, following this first presentation, they're also here tonight to provide 
uh, the school committee and community with insight in terms of the visioning work, an important component of our project uh, that soon will be to come. So with that, I'll turn it over. I'm not sure who's going to go first, but uh, Don, thank you. Good evening. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having us tonight. I'm Don Walter, principal with, uh, with Dorm Whittier, and I have the pleasure of doing the first uh, presentation. And uh, this process has been very fluid. So that's why you, often you're hearing information just after, just after we are. So tonight what we want to do is uh, take you through the, um, an update as to what we learned and heard at the meeting, the four boards meeting on the 31st of May, and subsequently information that we've learned uh, from MSBA. As you know, leading up to the meeting on the 31st, we had had discussions with MSBA, which um, quite frankly brought us to that four boards meeting. And then subsequently, uh, we've had a couple other conversations with them, which helping to guide us through this, uh, through this process. So we're gonna give you an update on that. Uh, gonna talk about the design enrollments, those that have been approved uh, as part of this study through the MSBA already. Uh, there's three different uh, design enrollments in three different schools that uh, we'll be looking at and also talk about what the um, uh, potential uh, further exploration might be, that which has not already been approved by MSBA but has come through a lot of exploratory work with leadership group uh, and our, uh, our teams here. Uh, after that, we'll talk about schedule impact of that, how we are today moving forward if nothing changes and what may happen if a uh, further uh, option is allowed to be explored. And then we'll summarize this all at the end. So, um, so in terms of the update, so our takeaways from the meeting on the, the 31st, or as, as you can see here on the screen, that um, really any, any project uh, within, the, uh, within the community that, that changes the current grade configuration uh, that we have is um, gonna impact the entire town, uh, not just uh, one side or the other, but the entire town uh, in one way or another. Uh, moving the grades five to the middle school and eighth grade to the high school uh, have some educational operational challenges that would need to be explored. And we're gonna talk about that a little further as we uh, get into this discussion. The, um, we did, I uh, suspect that there was some su support for some level of consolidation. And there are the three options that we'll be looking at. Two of them already have consolidation built into them. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, regardless of where this goes, we want to make sure that the entire town is taken into consideration. All the schools, uh, pre-K through five, uh, either today uh, through the, the current study or plan for something else down the road. So that's, that's very important. And then uh, part of the takeaway there also was that perhaps there's interest in looking at a district-wide solution. So in this case, a pre-K through five district-wide solution. So that was, those were our uh, takeaways from that meeting on the 31st. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, as I mentioned, we had a couple conversations with MSBA. Um, we had the initial conversation. They went back and thought about things. We came out and presented, <laughs> presented different items. And uh, a summary here is what, uh, what we learned from MSBA. So uh, they're certainly willing to consider uh, perhaps the district's request, but they saw it as their, their financial obligation would not increase from what would be the largest school that's already been approved, which was a 755 student. It's a Wildwood project initially, um, but they allowed a, the district to look at also the uh, Woburn and North Elementary School. So uh, both of those are the only projects that would be considered uh, through MSBA. They may, it's important, they may allow a pre-K through five district-wide solution uh, to be explored, but again, they will only pay their portion for 
is the 755 students that are uh, identified in Wildwood, Woburn, and North. So that's important. It's all important. Um, and then they asked us, well, 1,500 student school, will the community support it? Of course, we don't have the answer to that today, but uh, part of the, that discussion is it's, it's a very large school. Do you have some place to put it? Um, do you have the wherewithal to travel to wherever this site may be between busing and parents and uh, things of that nature? And, you know, quite frankly, will the, will the community support that? The other thing as it relates to a, a larger school is that, uh, uh, and it was said by the, the incoming, the new incoming director is that, well, while we have space available in the high school, space available uh, potentially in the middle school today, could the population trends change over time? And if you were, say, to put the eighth grade in the high school or the fifth grade into the middle school, what happens if the population increases and now you have no space? Did you, did you put yourselves into a box? So um, that was uh, a very good uh, comment that was made. And then um, lastly, and when we talked on, on the 31st, one of the options we discussed direct, was directly related to fifth grade and eighth grade moving up. That was a pre-K through four uh, solution. Uh, they, they are not interested in that because that's not part of the original approval that we were to be studying. So really what's on the table today are a, a Wildwood uh, only, a uh, Wildwood, uh, Woburn pre-K through three, three and, a, and all three elementary schools pre-K through five. So that gives you an update as to our takeaways on the 31st and what we had most recently heard from the MSBA, and I don't know if there's any questions on that or if I should keep rolling along. I'll keep rolling. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We've all been tuning in, so. Yeah. Sure. Um, so the, the current options to be studied, uh, this is a reiter reiteration for all of you, but I'll, I'll say it anyway, is the uh, Wildwood School uh, to remain pre-KK at about 130 students. And in each of these solutions, we'd be looking at a repair of the existing building, additions or renovations uh, to the building, and uh, new options uh, for the building. Uh, Pre-K through three solution for 510 students at Wildwood and Woburn, and a pre-K through five uh, student school, 755 students, Wildwood, Woburn, and North. So those are the options that basically SMMA <coughs> and Dormwood have been hired to study working with the, uh, the district and the town. Based upon that last meeting with, uh, with MSBA, the, the pre-K through four really came off the table, uh, in our opinion, in working with the leadership group. So uh, we would study those first three options uh, that uh, I just mentioned, and also under consideration is a pre-K through five district-wide solution. And when we say that's under consideration, that's, that's what you as a community would ask for. You would ask that of MSBA, can we study that in addition to what we're already looking at? So, um, and the, obviously the pre-K through five district wide would involve <coughs> all six elementary schools. Just to reiterate, as far as their participation financially, they would reimburse their share of the Wildwood, Woburn, and North 755 students, theoretical other 750 students, uh, that portion of the building would not be reimbursed. So they would prorate their reimbursement on the, uh, on the entire project. So we'll keep going. Actually, I have just a qu question. Do you know what type of calculation or formula um, the MSBA uses to calculate what portion, like, you know, what 17, you know, what 755 students of a larger school is worth? Because presumably it's not half of a duck school twice as large. It doesn't cost twice as much money to build a school, you know, of twice as many students. It, it, it's, it's, an in, it's a very good question. And we don't have a finite uh, answer on that. But if you, if you think about, you're basically two schools under one roof in, in many respects, right? You, you would presume, certainly have more classrooms. You would have more art, more music. You would likely have two uh, gymnasia. 
you may have two administrations, uh, more special education space. So in simple terms, you really may be doubling the size of that school. So maybe the, maybe the, the best way to think about it is that you be getting paid for half of that overall school, their portion of half. If that makes sense. Yeah. Back up live. Mr. Smith. Yeah, oh, so sorry. I have a question. Um, do you know um, of any school district in a state who has done something like this, where they've gone you know, back to um, the MSBA and built a bigger school outside of that where they paid only a portion of it? Has, is that something you're aware of? So, and Jason, maybe you know better than me, but we, we do know that there are other districts who have made requests to change what was initially um, accepted or approved by the MSBA board. I don't know the detail of that unless you do, Jason. I, I don't know the detail, but we, I think we can speak confidently that there have been a handful of those where uh, some conditions have changed. Um, and a, a renegotiation has, has taken place with the MSBA. Um, I will also say that there have been a handful of projects where um, <coughs> things like the classroom count um, didn't align with the MSBA's sort of out-of-the-box um, count in terms of their guidelines, and the district have, districts have opted to pay for those additional spaces uh, on their own. So those are sort of two examples of um, communities taking on uh, expense because they think it's the right thing to do for them and they're at slightly different scales one is related to enrollment and one is related to a series of individual spaces but those things have happened in the past and just speaking about their the financial commitment of MSBA uh, it's important to note that when districts get invited into the program there's a finite amount of money uh, annually to fund these projects. So MSBA, through their calculations, says, okay, we can invite seven projects in because we have this much money. So, I'm making the number up. So if, if there were seven projects allowed in along with the Wildwood School, they knew they could finance their portion up to 755 students. Now, if, we're look, if we were coming back to look for more, they're like, well, we don't have that money earmarked. It's gonna hurt future projects. So, just wanted to. Uh, sure. Yeah, just a clarifying question, just for community awareness. Sure. Uh, so from what I understand, any project that we work on has to include pre-K and kindergarten because the original school, Wildwood, was a pre-K and kindergarten school. That correct? is correct. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yep. Good question. Okay. So in, in terms of the schedule, um, what we have up on the screen here now is, is the current schedule. Right, in, in the way we see this happening, the, the red dash line is where we are today. We would do our feasibility study uh, into schematic design, which would allow us to vote uh, sometime in the spring of 25 on a project, whatever the project is as the community decides to move forward with. We then go through design and construction and have an occupancy uh, thereabouts uh, the fall of 2028. If we go so far, and I'm, I'm just a collective we, <laughs> to, to make a request of MSBA that we want to study this additional option. Uh, what happens is you, you make that request by, um, I think it's the 27th of this month, that's on a future slide. They would um, take that into consideration, and by October we'd know if, there, if it's a, a yay or nay uh, to move forward that, thus losing upwards of six months worth of time, of study time that we could be doing. But maybe even more importantly, because of the way the calendar is working, you may actually not be able to occupy that building for another school year. So you may not occupy until September of 29. And that's important that you, you, can, you can move into schools mid-year over vacations, but especially when you're talking about a consolidation of many schools, it, it's quite challenging. Um, and, schools of this size that we're talking about it would, it would be uh, quite challenging <clears throat> so that is an overview on that and then in terms of the next steps this is the detail of of that second schedule so here we are in June we're, we're considering uh, perhaps submitting to MSBA to study an additional option 
So it is by June 27th. At their MSBA board meeting on the 30th, uh, they would move the project out of feasibility study, which we're now back into eligibility phase. Uh, and then by the next board meeting, the end of October, they would make a determination of uh, whether the, it could be studied and what the actual enrollment configuration uh, would be for that larger school. And then we'd continue in November with the feasibility study. So, to summarize, <laughs> here we are with the pre-K, K, pre-K pre three, pre-K five current options that we're exploring. Uh, can we ex explore other configurations? That's the maybe, ask MSBA, and here you go. Um, so, the pre-K, K, pre-K pre three, pre-K five, <laughs> on the north side, and then the pre-K-5 district-wide solution. So uh, just to reiterate, they would pay up to the 755 student max their portion of their uh, of reimbursement. So that's where we are. I know you've all heard that before, <laughs> maybe, maybe twice before. <laughs> yes, please. Um, th thank you, uh, Don. Just, just before, I, I'm sure there are m many questions around the group, but I, I just think, uh, you know, the committee knows this, but for, again, for the benefit of the community watching, um, there's a lot of information here to take in. We, we, we recognize that, and some of us have the benefit of um, thinking about this every day uh, and, and a, a, lot of, a lot of days. But I, I do think it's important to point out a couple of things. First off, the Wildwood is and remains the priority. It was when we submitted the statement of interests a number of years back. That has not changed. We, uh, we are in a better place, I think, and we've talked about this before in terms of temporary or interim space for a good number of years. But the Wildwood remains a priority as we're having all of this dialogue and discussion. The pursuit of school consolidation remains a priority. It has not wavered or has not changed from the original facilities master plan that was completed by the town in 2018 as a logical step for this town to take to improve the teaching learning conditions over six very small and operationally problematic elementary schools, uh, all of which are, in, uh, are certainly are dated and well, well maintained, do not provide contemporary educational space to support student learning. Consolidation as a goal here does not change or has not changed from our original submission. The reason that we're here and having this conversation, these conversations with the, the, the four boards recently, is because after further consideration with the leadership group, we don't have another name for us, but the leadership group of those that I mentioned earlier, we recognize, and as your superintendent, I also recognize that there has been increasingly over the last perhaps couple of years, greater focus and maybe questions by some in the community about what we should do as a community with the capacity that we now know we have at the middle school and high school that wasn't known in the same way that it is now from the time that we completed these statement of interests. And we believe, and I believe, that this is part of due diligence to just get a sense of the leadership groups in town as to whether or not there's an appetite or a will or desire to explore, to study another possible option here over and above those that we have submitted, which are shown on your screen there as those three options that both the school committee and the select board had to sign off and approve back in 20, I keep getting those days up, 2022. <laughs> so we're only here before we press our foot on that go pedal to get a sense of whether or not there's a possible interest to think more broadly about that capacity, to explore that capacity that we have at the middle school and high school, and to also, in so doing, recognize that we have a lot of buildings that need to be attended to. We have two sides of town that need to be attended to. With the Wildwood Project that we submitted and that this committee and the select board agreed to, we, by necessity, have to focus this project on the north side of town, by necessity. That leaves the west side unattended. And to the leadership group, it just seemed like, before pressing go, um, a, an opportunity here to explore whether or not there was an interest to return to the MSBA and to request consideration for possibly exploring and studying another option. As it is, we have to have these folks 
primarily Torm Whittier, and their team study three options. We have to. What we're really doing here is just seeking a sense of the community as to whether or not there's a desire to return to the MSBA and expand that. It doesn't lock us into it. It's also, I think, important to point out, and there's been in some of the conversation re recently perhaps some misunderstanding or misinformation, this does not this does not withdraw us from the MSBA program. And folks at the table here, you can back me up and, and affirm this. Um, we, 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 we could go to the MSBA and they could say no. You're in the program for what you've committed to and we committed to and you need to move forward with that. They're not kicking us out of the program. Or they could say, well, we'll, 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 we'll reconsider this. Um, I'll pause there, but I just think that context is important here uh, for not just this community, those those watching at home, and and the you know the community at large. Well, thank you. Uh, did you want to respond quickly? If I if I could just uh, confirm what Dr. Brand is saying, yes. If if the request is made for the pre-K through five district-wide solution, there's there's no risk of being uh, asked to leave the program. But I, I was remiss in that if, if you tried to pursue a pre-K through four solution, they did say that you would have to withdraw from the program and reapply through a, a new statement of interest. And, and as you know, while it's, it's not competitive, it, it's based on need. So if that need does not meet other districts that you may be submitting with in the future, you don't know when or if you'd get back in with that. So that's for the pre-K through four only. That was originally discussed back in May 31st. And, the, and that's the option where the fifth grade moves up to the high Correct. school and the eighth grade, sorry, fifth grade to the middle school and yes. the eighth, eighth grade, grade moves up school. to the high school. Yes. All right. Ms. Burns. Thank you. So <clears throat> I think I caution too, and it's, 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 it's tough because I went through the building of, of this building with you folks um, in the, in the, unexpectedness of things that arise and the issues that we unexpected issues of mitigation with the wetlands and things of that sort and it the layout of our community hasn't changed it's it's Joanne Benton's mitten hmm. okay and I, I recall that because it was that was early on in my tenure here and I, I recall the rationale behind it in sitting through the Board of Selectmen meeting and, and just listening to that feedback, I think what makes it difficult, and I have to tell you that I'm, I'm not I'm at this juncture until I'm convinced otherwise, and I understand the work that you need to do in order to bring that to fruition, to, to expand upon the possibilities. I get it. I'm, I, I'm not in favor of a pre-K uh, district, pre-K-5 district. I, I, I'm not interested in exploring that. Um, for the same reasons that were discussed six years ago in the facilities master plan, which I know you've heard all about. Um, I, our infrastructure and the roads do, cannot support that no matter where you put it. I, knowing this community, um, the wetlands that we currently have and the new development that has since taken place in the six years and in the years prior to that, that you were involved with the building of this high school, um, there's less of areas to mitigate for wetlands. Um, and and frankly, I, I think that what's that was what makes this that particular topic difficult to get that approval and commitment to because for those you're talking to people who a lot of them who've been here for 30 years they know the layout of this uh, geographic layout of our community. I do have real concern with um, and which impacts and that has to be looked at broadly, which I know you will do, but but. I, I guess where, where I struggle, and in in I think the rationale of my opinion, is that because of that mitten and that top part, there's really not a centralized location that we could a support a building of that size and support a traffic pattern that it would create on top of the increased traffic patterns that have since transpired and, has gr and have grown mm -hmm. since that study and since you were last in Wilmington. Um, and and I, I think the proposals are great if you can if you can just as a basic where can I envision this potentially let's and then then say let's vet it out that may be possible let's vet it out but be, in, in in many as you know you've spoken to them during your presentations earlier this week I think that is um, 
that is, is what's tripping us up in that buy-in sure. for those certain aspects. Um, my concern still re revolves around um, the traffic patterns, the, the extended bus rides. Um, so location would be key, and knowing the geographical and, and, the, and Wilmington in general, um, I, I too struggle with, I, I'm not against feasibility studies, but it's sort of, I wanna make sure that they have some viability to it. So that's where I struggle. I still think it's very important that one of the biggest <clears throat> discussions around our consolidation plan, which I heavily support, um, is the transitions um, that we, we're we seeing in our grades from the third graders into the fourth. And I think you've been a part of some of that conversation in our when we were doing this, um, which I, I still think um, I still think is um, uh, 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 something instrumental as well as the, the development of children. I don't think a kindergarten should be on the bus with a fifth grader. Um, I think, and, and if you're extending the length of time of bus rides, I think that could cause, uh, open up itself to potential problems. So that's the other aspect, and you'll have more parents driving children to avoid that. So hence, you know, um, but although, and I am absolutely with the Wildwood piece, I, I think this is the, we're at the precipice of this. What we decide going forth in this project, ideally I would love a pre-K to fourth grade. I think that would be ideal and then move the fifth grade into the middle school, but not move out the eighth. You know what I mean? That's how I grew up. I grew up with a five through eighth uh, middle school. But um, uh, my big thing, this, this project is in, going to impact this municipality even beyond the years. Um, big issue with me right now is the equality, as Dr. Brand has spoken to, that the North Street is getting this project, but we can't think, we can't, we've got to ensure that we're not thinking so short-minded because I think that's going to cost us in the long run and all the good that we're trying to do with this build could actually bite us in the tuchus to some capacity. We could do it better, you know what I mean? Graded prices of builds are, are only going to go up and that's not going to change in the future. I do and I heavily suggest and recommend that as we approach this project, whichever pathway we choose, that we, we have those discussions with the leadership boards of this community to ensure that we're, we are now moving forward with the other side of town. We can't wait three or four years and start the process over again. We need to do, it needs to overlap in some capacity and mirror whatever we do here at the middle school, uh, excuse me, at the, on the north side has to be done in conjunction if, if not when this project ends its completion. But that discussion needs to start early and we and I think we know that taxpayers alone they'll be funding this you know to some portion um, and we, I, we we can't and I recognize the concerns of the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee personally I think we may need to revisit what projects we currently have um, but we also need to make we also need to make the schools a priority for our students and our families because it's going to impact the educational experience for all of our students and it's tough because we are here for all our, all students not just half of this town and say well you got to have to kind of suck it up and be patient that's that's not how I can rationalize it because we need to move forward in a continuum um, for both of these in, in both of these projects right now the north side would be the starting the first step but the west side needs to be the last step, if I'm explaining that right. But mm -hmm. thank you very much. Thank you. Comments? I think she, I think she wants to respond. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question, but I think this she wants to respond. Thanks. <laughs> 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 um, Ms. Burns, I, I think that was really well said. Thank you. Um, I, I think one of the intentions when I, we as a leadership group started talking about this was to I think one of the intentions when we as a leadership group started talking about you know, the possibility of a district-wide solution, it was really about the study. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it wasn't necessarily about the, the understanding that this would be the evolution. And I think that we, we as a team have, have discussed this. And knowing that in that study, you would be studying all six schools at once, which would give a great indication as to you know what are what are your issues? What you know what could be accomplished by doing a district-wide solution? I don't think any one of us are from the town of Wilmington, 
So we do rely heavily on the expertise of the people that live here and know the area and know um, the land mm -hmm. and know what's available and what's not available. And we really, really do appreciate all the feedback that we've gotten from the select board, from the finance committee. Um, it's been really informative to all of us. But the only thing I would like to just add or even just reiterate is the only thing we were looking to accomplish here was to just perform the study. We weren't looking to make the decision and that decision in the end always comes down to the school building committee. So whatever you know, we propose, whether it's a, a renovation to the existing building, whether it's an addition renovation to the Wildwood, the Woburn Street, or the North Intermediate, or another parcel of land, it really was just about the study. And, you know, as you mentioned, that you're going to need to make sure you're doing for one side of the town and in kind for the other side of town, whether it's on the same trajectory or staggered a little bit. The issue becomes that if you are looking to go back into the study with the MSBA, we won't complete this Wildwood project until 2028 for the construction, but the closeout actually takes more than a year mm -hmm. with the MSBA for documentation and all of that for final payments and you to, for you all to receive your final payment. So you wouldn't actually be able to enter into a statement of interest most likely until 2030. Mm -hmm. And that's just putting it in. I mean, there are Andover, we talked about it the other night, submitted 10 statements of interest and they still haven't, for their high school, and they still haven't gotten into the program. Mm -hmm. And so the chances of you getting back into that program are, are I don't want to use the word slim, but they're challenging. Um, so our thought was if we had this information and we, did not find a site that was viable, we at least had the information for you to make that educated decision on how you wanted to move forward with the other side of town. And if that is you know, an opportunity, uh, there are communities that have done things that we call them sister schools, which you build the same exact school mm -hmm. in two sides of town, whether at the same time or slightly skewed or whatever the case may be, but one side would be funded um, with the MSBA and the other side would be funded by the community. Mm -hmm. Now, this is going to sound, um, hmm, I don't know the right word, but if you were to do one school, it's, it's, it would be less money overall for the taxpayers than doing two schools with two sites because you're, and I wouldn't say like significantly less, I'm not saying like a dollar less, but you know, there, there is some cost savings by combining one school. I'm not saying that's the option for your community. We just wanted to present you all with the facts and give our expertise as to what we've known for, you know, what we've done for years so that the community is knowledgeable. So that when you go to town vote and people ask these questions, you can say, yes, we've explored them, we've talked about them as, as boards, as leadership teams, and we've explored those possibilities, and we thank you for asking the questions, and here's the information we've received. Wait to pure personal preference? Uh, we'll go ahead. <coughs> so, thank you for that. Sure. I, um, so, let me try to understand. Mm -hmm. I wanna make sure I understand. So, by doing this, because, I, you know, time is money, money's time. So that's where my thought was with regards to even entertaining that district-wide thing, A. Um, B, so the second thing, so this, by doing that, this would also make it clear that a, a district pre-K to five would not be possible or feasible, correct? In that study, that could be the end, that possibly could be the end recommendation, correct? Could be, yeah. Okay. So. Um, I made a note and I can't read my writing, so my apologies. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so, and, and so, and what, in doing that, and let's say hypothetically we, we get, we do the feasibility study with all those. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just, I, my thing is, it's just the time piece, but anyway, sure. moving on. Um, so, 
Sorry, I've lost my train of thought. I, I guess, um, so what part of the facility master plan that's only six years old and the buildings went through and the price points were all there six and because I'm one of those taxpayers that it's sort of like, look, we put a lot of money out to, ob to observe something. It's, you're not starting at ground zero. I know that you have to take, you know, you have to look at things with a clear set of eyes six years later, but a lot of that is still foundational, you know? Um, how much of that do you, and I'm not gonna keep you to a, an exact answer, okay, it's hypothetical. How much of that piece and that master plan, because you heard about it the past two days, are you taking, will, will be a part of some of that study that you're doing? Like as a reference point or, I mean, that's gotta be incorporated because it's, I, that's where I think I'm, I struggle mm. a lot. And then logistically, my common sense approach, this is probably the, 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 the middle area of town. So I think that's the other piece that I, I struggle with in, in that proposal. But <clears throat> if this will allow us to, to rule out um, recommend uh, possibilities so be it I just again I think it goes back to trying to correlate these possibilities with with a possible you know um, the reality viability yeah. take and consider swamps development things of that sort and infrastructure so um, thank you again I appreciate your comments thank Absolutely. you yeah Mr. McCauley yeah thanks <clears throat> So thank you for the talk. I saw it last night too. Delivered it really well. Uh, so I think it's more for MJ. So I actually sat in on the select board and the finance committee meetings, and I found them both to be really enlightening and mm -hmm. really educational for me. And I think to your point about making sure we do something on both sides of town, um, I did hear that support from both boards um, that – I think it was a little bit – it was pretty vocalized last night at the finance committee too where – this is clearly going to be like a north side project you know mo I'm sorry this will be a north side project yeah we need to in parallel track something for the west okay and that was really good for me to one hear. of my biggest priorities is to yeah, yeah. and um, i also heard that at the select board meeting as well too and that's something i think for maybe our committee to think about is you know if let's say you know we can't pursue this pre-k through five option making sure that we can parallel track those conversations mm -hmm. with the select board, with the finance committee, work together with them to make sure we can get a viable plan in place while leveraging this plan to take advantage of the MSBA money. Mm -hmm. So um, just want to say, you know, I think we can work with the boards. And I was really uh, heartened to hear that both, I think, are in favor of some level of consolidation mm -hmm. and that they don't want to neglect the west side of town. They also <coughs> want to do this in parallel. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. No problem. Mr. Turner? So one point of clarification in terms of the visioning, which I know is the next presentation, if we don't do the option to explore a pre-K through five town wide, as part of the visioning, can we still talk to the whole town and then to your point about sister schools or at least similar schools, get the understanding that if we build this type of school over here, the rest of the town agrees that substantially similar school could be built on the other side and basically do the visioning process once for all six schools, even if the timing of the two builds is slightly staggered or, or however they end up working out, we can benefit from that knowledge and don't have to redo the work of visioning. We can, there's, no, there's no issue from a scope perspective with MSBA of visioning the whole town, even though the scope of MSBA is those three schools. Yeah, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll respond to that briefly now, and it will be covered some in the, yeah. in the presentation to come. <clears throat> um, as Don said just a few minutes ago, any decision related to the MSBA project will impact everybody across the entire town. Mm -hmm. And so our proposal for visioning is to include conversations at the district-wide level. And yes, there was some work done in the master plan, but we have different players now, we have different issues now, mm -hmm. you know, we want to make sure that we re-examine, you know, school size, school count, school location, right? all of those sort of district-wide issues so that the decisions that are made for the MSBA project, they can positively impact whatever happens next with, um, with the schools that aren't impacted by the MSBA okay. project directly. So okay. yes, we would cover that as part of, part of the visioning effort. Very good. And, and just as a general comment, thank you for the thoroughness of going through this exercise. I appreciate it. So, thank you. Yes. Julie? I just want to add, um, 
I know you were talking about the visioning process, but I just wanted to add that the Wildwood School Building Committee, which was rather um, small because they were working on the interim solution, one of the things as a leadership group we decided to do was to expand that group and to make sure that we included people from um, educators to special education to parents from the north side, parents from the west side. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we had a wide range of people so that when we're making this you know, ultimate decision on what school is best for the community, everyone has, um, has, has had an opportunity to have a vote, somebody from you know, each walk of life. So we did expand that to, um, I think we're up to 22. 22 people on, on our committee. So it's a really great spattering of people that will um, help us to guide this project forward. Mr. Smaha. Yeah, I just want to just sort of bring up the the idea of the importance, um, I guess some of the background, I think a lot of us know this, but I, I want to just make sure that everybody who's involved in this process understands that, in my opinion, like Wilmington has an elementary school building problem, and that's where this all stems from. That if we're saying, and I know it was mentioned last night at the Finance Committee, that school buildings are meant to last about 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, every single one of our school buildings is now, I'm sorry, our elementary school buildings is over 50 years old. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a problem that um, Wilmington has not dealt with, and it's a very expensive problem. And we need to find the will to get this done because if we decide, right, um, to do just the Wildwood School, for example, and not do anything else in town, because that's sort of the least expensive option, I would imagine. We're going to have buildings that are going to be 60, 70, 80 years old within, to within time. And if we're waiting, I was in my head, I'm thinking, okay, every seven years, in the best case scenario, we would always get into the MSB, MSBA, and every seven years we'd be, we'd be knocking out. But then hearing this, it's like, it's not really every seven years, it's more like eight, nine, maybe 10 years. And so you're just building this out over time. And you think about what's happened at the Wildwood School, which when we submitted the SOI, so that is our oldest school, right? And that's why this, we submitted the SOI for the Wildwood. But that doesn't mean all other schools are like these great facilities. The Wildwood School was 65 years old when we submitted the SOI. Today, the Boutwell is 62, the North is 61, and by the time these come to completion, you know, by the time the Wildwood is completed, the Boutwell is gonna be older than the Wildwood was when we first submitted this statement of interest. Um, so I, I just I want to just center our center us on that fact, um, and, and, and I think in addition to that, um, I think thinking about the, the vote that we're going to need to take tonight, right, about whether or not to expand, go back to the MSBA. Um, that portion of it, I think. Well, I think that we as a town need to be working together. So after um, hearing you know, the select board and the finance committee votes, right? I think that it doesn't make sense for us to go back to the MSBA um, because we need to build agreement, we need to build consensus among all the boards. But I also think, I'm also, uh, I, I will say disappointed that um, we're not even going to explore a district-wide option. I am pretty sure there isn't the land for it. I am pretty sure it's going to make traffic worse. But I don't know for sure. Even <laughs> though I'm like, think so? I don't know that for sure. And I think that um, it's irresponsible of us to not explore that. But at the same time, I know we need to have consensus and agreement um, with uh, the select board and the finance committee who have all, um, or those two boards have, have voted um, against uh, per, you know, going back and pursuing that district-wide option. So um, I, I think that 
we really need to be thinking about what is best for the future of these schools. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad to hear um, your takeaway um, about the sort of parallel projects because to me, that as it is now, that's the only solution. Or otherwise, we're gonna have buildings failing, you know, left and right. No matter how well, you know, George Hooper is able to upkeep um, those buildings, it's not. <coughs> we're, we're gonna find ourselves in a really, really um, bad place. And it's gonna take a lot of will by all the boards in town, by the community, and it is going to be expensive. <clears throat> I don't think we can get around that fact. But we, our, our youngest building, youngest elementary school building, is the Shawshin, which is, was built in 1970. It's 53 years old. So I just want to make sure that we understand that this is a, a, a town-wide problem, and, it's, and, it's, and we have not dealt with it, and we have to deal with it. Okay. Dr. Bryson? I always love waiting to go to the end to see what my <laughs> colleagues have to say because I'm like, yes, Jay, that is, exactly, uh, that is exactly what I would have said, so I'm not going to repeat, but thank you. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about moving forward, and I, I don't exactly know how I feel about what we should do tonight because I feel like the process of how this is all rolled out has been off, and instead of us doing this and meeting and talking through it and then providing a recommendation to the other boards, and let me take a step back, the Wildwood Building Committee meeting and talking about this, mm -hmm. giving us their recommendation, us then talking about it with a little bit less expertise, than, and then us sharing with the select board and the finance committee what our recommendation was. That did not happen. And so now we're in this spot that's really complicated for us, um, and we're the ones responsible, really, for making this important decision. And so I'm in, I'm in a stuck place, but what I will say I've learned over the past, when I first got that email about the tri board, I was like, huh, interesting. I wonder what the Wildwood Building Committee thought about that. Hmm, I wonder who this leadership team, who's making, so it's like, it doesn't feel good and it doesn't feel transparent. And when we voted for these SOIs originally, we did all this work about Wildwood. One of the major things we kept saying to the public was, this is not just Wildwood. This is for all of Wilmington. And we built a ton of consensus around that. That no one was going into that Wildwood project saying, but what about my side? Nobody. We had people at that town meeting. We had all those colored things in the air. There was no one saying, wait, that's my side. No, that's your, nothing like that was happening. And all of a sudden now we're in this other place. And I'm like, geez, how did we get here? And so I really just want to proceed sort of cautiously and just to make sure that when we say there's a leadership team making these decisions, they, there has to be some form of What's the process here? The process, I think, initially was to not have to necessarily present at each of these meetings. Well, now you've had to present this <laughs> multiple times, and we've had to listen to it multiple times. So, and we're in not a better place now than we were at that tri-board meeting. And I'm right back to, I'm sitting here thinking, oh my goodness, what is this reminiscent of? This feels like me deciding whether or not we should have masks or not. That's how I'm feeling. I'm being asked to make a decision that I don't have all the answers to. I am not an expert on the land. I don't know where the, I don't know how many acres we, I don't have any of that information. I'm being asked to vote on something that I don't feel comfortable voting on because I don't, I'm not the expert in the room. And so when I say process, I'm like, we've got to be clear and there's got to be a process in place so that when we're sitting here having these conversations and spending our quality time doing this, that we know we have all the facts we need to make these decisions. I think we put the select board in a pretty tricky place I think we put the finance committee in a pretty tricky place, and now there's some repair work we're gonna have to do with whatever we decide tonight. So if we decide to vote on this, I can't imagine it's gonna pass anyway, but say we did, before I would even feel comfortable, I'd say stop, we have to go back and talk to these boards. We've got to reestablish rapport with these boards because we're not in a good place right now, where I feel like initially at the beginning that we were in a very good place. But back to your, I agree that I don't have the answers. I don't know what that would look like. I've been in buildings that have multiple schools and it works really well um, in very small cities. I mean, Chelsea, like I've mentioned, is four elementary schools in one complex. And, and uh, the city's 1.8 miles big, I mean, it's a tiny, tiny little place. Um, there's 500 kids in each of those buildings. There's two early starts and there's two late starts. 
I mean, it worked. It never felt like it wasn't working. I mean, I worked there for over 10 years. My husband worked there for over 20 years. I mean, like, it never felt like it wasn't working. So I think there's so much that we just don't know because, frankly, this isn't my, this is what I do. So I, I'm so worried about making a bad decision tonight that is going to have such serious consequences down the road where we say, ah, if only we had, if only someone had led us in the right direction. And so I just really want to talk to all of us. We have to be really thoughtful and careful about where this goes tonight because I think this is a very, very important piece of this puzzle. And to Jay's point, could we? Would we? My gut says probably not. I don't know. But I do not know. And unless someone can say to me, Jen, we would need this amount of acres, and there is no place in Wilmington that has that. Then I'd say, oh, okay, then what are we doing here? But I have not heard that. So I need a little bit more in order for me to kind of feel one way or the other. Mr. McCauley. Then Mr. Yeah, so um, I agreed with your comments that you just had here as well. So Thanks. very well said. <laughs> I love our committee. I know. Um, <laughs> one thing you touched on is something I was thinking of, because you know I'm relatively new here, and I I may, people may not agree with me on this, but I actually did like when we had all the boards together because mm -hmm. it kind of felt like we were all working together and we could all talk with each other freely. And then I attended the meetings this week and it kind of felt a little siloed. And then, you know, I, I attended both and, you know, I followed my protocol, right? You know, I had to wait till public comment. But it would have been nice, I think, if we all could have had that more free discussion and maybe kind of had hashed a lot of this out because I think there was great points brought up in the select board meeting and also in the finance committee meeting that would have been great for I think everyone here to listen to and hear and kind of take in so that might be something um, building rapport going forward you know with whatever we decide here but I think with all these buildings maybe entertaining that as an option like trying to meet with these other boards to kind of get aligned and really make it a whole town you know effort or something like that No, so I'll, I'll I'll be brief because I think we've covered most of it and thank you for doing this three nights in a row mm -hmm. I appreciate it um, you know I came in tonight with sort of an open mind but leaning towards we call it stay the course right just because in conversations I've had in the community I don't see that there's an appetite for a district-wide k-5 to building but hearing the conversation I am disappointed maybe because my original question you answered in response to mrs burns what would we have gained from this outside of maybe building a build a big building what would that study have gotten us what could we have learned from that and i feel like that information gets lost in we don't have anywhere to put a giant building so let's not do it and i i, I get it but also it, it's disappointing to me on on this side of the table to say, well, now we're going to miss out potentially on learning something or gaining some insight because we don't know if we can even do this project or if the town would even support it. So, um, but thank you for, for doing this. I appreciate it. Do you mind if I respond? Pick up, please, I, I, please I think that was the, the whole intent was, you know, to Dr. Bryson's point, the intent of the four boards all coming together so that everyone got the message at once. Um, we didn't want to slight any one committee over another and make people feel like, you know, we're hearing about this rumblings on the street and we just got a phone call after a meeting and can you believe they're going to do this? You know, and, and we wanted to make sure we provided all the information to you in one meeting so that everyone heard the same message. After that meeting on May 31st, we had a, a subsequent a call with the MSBA which then led us to understand that the pre-k to 4 option would force us to remove ourselves from the program so we wanted to clarify and make sure everybody was all on the same page which is the presentation that we're giving this evening um, but really the the crux of it all is that you know studying a district-wide solution really is about studying the six schools and, and whether you, there is land or there isn't land, again, I've said, you all live here. I'm sure you all know what's here, what's not here. But we, as the experts, that would be our job. That's what we study. We go through every piece and every parcel and, and come back with the conclusions and all of the data for you to say, and it could be, you're right, there's no place to go. 
However, what we've learned is this, 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 and this. Um, and, and I think what really did get lost in all of this was we have no place to put it. We have no roads. You know, they're, 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 these are all neighborhood schools. Um, you know, we, we heard a lot of the we can't, we can't, we can't. And what we were trying to show you is that that all might be true. And we all agree with it. But the only thing we were looking for was an answer to, to whether or not we could just study it and give you back the data. We weren't asking to make a decision on what kind of school to move forward on. We were asking permission to study it. And I think all of that got lost. Mm -hmm. And so really that's, that was the, the whole intent of this. And it was not to cause an uproar with four boards or pit people against each other or have, you know, large disagreements, it was really to give you the data to inform you so that you could make an informed decision on how to move forward in your community. And whether it's for one side and, and the other side, just so that we're clear, I grew up in a town that had both sides. I had a north and a south. And I went to school in south, and we didn't like the kids in north. And when I was a sophomore in high school, they combined schools. I graduated with 500 students. So I understand. I live in a community where we just took three elementary schools and combined them into one. I, I, I understand. I, I'm not, I'm, first and foremost, I'm a parent. I understand where all of you are coming from. So we here as professionals, it's our job to, to impart our wisdom and our knowledge as in what we do for a career, but as, also as parents and people of other communities. So I just wanted you to understand that we were not at any point the leadership team looking to push you down a path you weren't interested in going on. We wanted to study the information to provide you all with all of your options so you knew how to move forward as a community. And I'm not sure if that's helpful or not helpful, but. Um, I was also encouraged um, the same way that Mike was that uh, to see you know, clear vocal support for really addressing, you know, the, the whole town's issues going forward, um, you know, not just sort of this one particular project, because that's absolutely and obviously the way that we need, the way that we need to think. Um, that at the same time that we're, you know, focusing on this one particular project, we need to just have the next one in mind and be thinking about, like, what can we do at what kind of parallel or staggered, um, you know, staggered schedule? Can we start to kind of push that forward? Um, I don't think that we have much likelihood, even if we wanted to, of getting into the MSBA a third time for schools on the west side of town. We've we've simply addressed our biggest and you know our biggest building problems, and uh, you know our our you know, worst schools um, with this uh, with this project. Um, you know, as you know, the Andover example, Martha's Vineyard Regional High School applied I don't know eight years in a row before finally getting their high school uh, into the program this year, uh, and I simply doubt that. Uh, you know, if we, you know, build this project and then come back uh, to say, say just like, hey, we'd like to do something on the west side of town, uh, now MSBA, that they'll consider that one of the highest priority building um, construction issues in the Commonwealth, which is what they're looking at each year. Just, you know, there's no guarantee. Just people apply and they look at, like, where are the, where, who has the most need? And when we had buildings like Wildwood, <laughs> then we were one of those com communities that had the most need. Uh, and I don't think we will be um, going forward. Uh, so it's something that I think we also need to, you know, recognize the, you know, overwhelming likelihood that the next, whatever we do next, is probably going to be us. Mm -hmm. um, which also, though, kind of frees us up because if we're not in having to deal with the MSBA, I mean, obviously there's a huge benefit to being in there, which is why we're here now. Um, but then, of course, we have more control over what we do and when, and you know, the procedure, the procedures are going to be different. So, but we need to be, we need to be thinking, you know, down the road, long terms. This is, goes back to Mr. Smaha's points about the age of uh, of our schools now. Um, you know, this is something that we are doing for the future of schooling in Wilmington, and uh, you know, it's not going to be, it's not, it's not even for us. It's just like, like our, you know, our kids are not going to be in this school, even the one that we're building now. 
uh, you know, hardly anyone who is currently in the district is going to actually have children in, in the school. Um, I mean, you know, some with young children. If you if you have kindergarten right now, your your kid might get there in fifth grade, and then if you have some coming up behind there. But you know, most of us who are uh, parents in this town, and you know, or just you know, members of the town, uh, you know, it's like it's 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 for the future. This is investment <coughs> that we are charged with making for the future of education in this community. And, uh, you know, again, it's going to be a whole new generation of students that ultimately um, take, advantage, uh, take advantage of these schools. Um, to the point of, of process, I do agree with much of what, of what Dr. Bryson said, and I think most, uh, most specifically that we need to use the Wildwood Building Committee you know, as effectively and efficiently as we can, because that's why we have it. Like, no one, um, you know, no, no one can object to saying that just like, we're going to take this to the Wildwood Building Committee and, you know, discuss it there, see what they think. There's representation from all three boards on the Wildwood Building Committee. That's, you know, deliberate that we have uh, FinCom Select Board and School Committee, like, on the Wildwood Building Committee. That's why we have it. And, uh, and I, I think that, you know, going forward, we really want to make sure that, uh, that that's, kind of the, not the point person obviously, but the point organization that this type of thing runs through. Um, we've, I mean, we, we obviously got a little bit, uh, a little bit caught up in some of the schedules and when people's meetings were and so forth, because, uh, you know, having the tri-board meeting, so we didn't have to do it serially, and then as has been pointed out, we ended up having to just present the entire thing uh, to each board uh, subsequently. Uh, on the actual option here, I think in the end we probably end up in the same place. So uh, I think even if we do it that way, we probably get here um, to the to the same position. And uh, even though at the, I keep calling it tribe board, but I guess it's more like the quad board um, <laughs> meeting, quad committee meeting. Uh, even though at the time there was general, there seemed to be a fair, by the straw vote we took at the end of the meeting, there seemed to be some general agreement of, yeah, we should pursue this. But I think the additional information we got really changed, I mean, very clearly uh, changed how, uh, how we look at that. Because initially it looked like we'd have more options to study, and in particular, that one that we really didn't want to say we didn't look at, which was dealing, as Dr. Brand said at the very start, with that capacity issue. Well, it turns out that the capacity issue, at least as far as moving eighth grade to the high school and fifth grade up, it turns out that's off the table. Can't do that without withdrawing from the program. So that's no good. And then we also learn, which I think we didn't think at the time, at the, you know, when we had the meeting on the 31st, that, oh, we only also, they'll only, which of course makes sense when you think about it, that they'll only fund up to what they agreed to fund beforehand. Um, you know, you can look at a larger school, but they're not going to pay for anything uh, beyond, uh, beyond what you've done. So we get that additional information, and our options have shrunk to, you know, to, of what we can study, and the appeal of those options have also um, been reduced. And so then we get to the situation about, um, you know, both the practicality of, the, you know, of putting a, a school this large somewhere in town, and I'm not going to run through all the different issues that people have brought up as far as just locations, and or I guess I'll run through them. I won't say anything more. <laughs> I guess I won't comment any further on them, but, you know, traffic and space and bus lengths and so forth. I will only bring them up to that extent. Uh, so there's, you know, there are plenty of issues you know, as, that go for that, but it's really also, also, I think, an issue that goes back to this. What do we envision for the future of education in Wilmington? What do we want? So even if it were possible to do, is, is, is that what we want? And there really doesn't seem to be, I think, in my judgment, any appetite that has been expressed for that type of solution. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I think maybe we, went, we could have gotten some potential criticism for not even exploring the possibility of using extra capacity at the high school or in the middle school to solve our problems. But I don't think anyone's going to say just like, well, did you study, you know, a 1,500 student school that we'll put in one place in town and every you know, elementary student in every corner of Wilmington uh, you know, has to be bused to or driven to. Um, I don't think there's really a lot, of, a lot of appetite for it. Now, it does come back to uh, the issue of, well, it's just a study. So you know, we don't have to, obviously, we don't have to build it. You know, it might even turn out to be, you know, to be feasible. Uh, and and I, I do take the point that it, the study, studying it would allow us to review all the schools, mm -hmm. like allows us to look at all the schools in town. And there's some benefit for that. Uh, but ultimately, if, I mean, if that's the real reason for it, if, it's, if we say, well, we don't really think this is going to work, no one really wants this kind of school, 
but we'll get to study some other stuff that we might find useful when we're actually dealing with the west side of town. I don't know that that's a sufficient justification for putting off this project for what realistically is going to be a year. So we've talked beforehand, we talked about like a three or a six month delay, and that's kind of in the process, but it's been pointed out. It's really a one year delay in the project because, you know, for this type of occupancy, we occupied this building mid-year over mm -hmm. February break. But that's just a high school built right next to the old high school. So the buses come to the exact same place. Everyone just walks over and carries their stuff to the new building. Even that wasn't easy because you have to move all the classrooms. We hired movers. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> Point I mean, that out. That's not, and yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that that was simple. Okay. But, yeah, trying to consolidate three different schools to suddenly all come together in one school, like, I mean, it's, no. Uh, so it really, you know, it's pushing it out for another year. You can't occupy it to the, to the next year. And, uh, and so based on, you know, the, the totality of that, I don't think in this circumstance that that trade-off is ultimately um, going to be worth it. So I'll stop there. Dr. Bryson. Can I just ask the, the leadership team, if you didn't have to get our, anybody's approval, you didn't need anyone to say, yes, go ahead, what would you want? What would you have done? So say there are no committees that have to approve anything. You're sitting in that meeting, Dr. Brand, right? And you're, talk, you're talking through this. I mean, this must have been a pretty interesting conversation. I think we were saying, like, it would have been nice to be in. I would have loved to have seen how that evolved because there must have been some pretty significant interest in discussing this to bring it forward the way it was. So I'm just curious, like, are we, are we making, are we, is this a mistake if we don't? I mean, I'm, you're the experts. You're the leadership, the leadership team, right? Those of you who sat, and I'm referring to anyone who sat in that space, if you did not need our approval, we didn't, there were no votes necessary, what would you do? This is like a business. You're running a business, this is Google or wherever, where they get to just do whatever they want because they don't have to necessarily do that. Is that true? I don't know. I don't know anything about schools. <laughs> I assume I that's how it works. Is that not how it works? I don't know. But anyway, my, so what would you recommend? MSBA is not involved either? Nope. Just mm. you. Just the leadership team. Yeah. This infamous leadership team. <laughs> we need a name. Uh, oh, I'm going to use it over yeah, and over. It, it's, I, I guess it's, it's a little different when there's not a process involved, right? If you're talking about me building a 1,500 student house as opposed to two 1,500 student houses for myself and my family, I, I guess I'd want to know if, if one or the other made more sense. Um, but that would just be us working in a vacuum, yeah. right? This, this is so much different than that. So having those discussions yielded, boy, we gotta get more information and, and share this with the different boards in, in the community. So it, it's a little unfair, <laughs> I guess, to, to, to try and answer that. I think you'd all answer me, but please. <laughs> She's no, the it, ringer on the board. Yeah. <laughs> But, but honestly, I, w I will say, because I've had the privilege of attending all those meetings, right? And, and, and we're constantly thinking about it, too, sure. and taking, out, taking all, that in, all that information in as it's, as it's presented. And what, what has come, and I'll speak for myself, right, because we haven't really talked about it. it. It seems to me that the potential time lost for not coming to a consensus solution for a larger school. Um, while <clears throat> it's a year for a 50 year solution, there, there are costs associated with that. So um, not only for the Wildwood students, but monetarily. That <coughs> the idea that we've heard tonight and been kind of rattling around in my head, if, if, we, if we can do uh, the 750, if it comes down to the 755 student solution, I'm looking at the, the screen up here, uh, for the north side, that you simultaneously study the west side, right? So, as I think you said, MJ, you, you, you set yourself up for the next step for that. And, and, and I will say, we had a, we've had a similar solution in the town of Westwood, where in that case, we were doing a, a three elementary school um, 
project study there in all different consolidation configurations and it turns out that two got selected and one did not hmm. so in that case the school committee is like well, wait a minute we can't just leave these guys over here by themselves they're going to sit there and say what about us so that school committee did hire us to do a separate study on that elementary school so they would know what <coughs> could happen to that school it's not going to be simultaneous but down the road so um, we've, we've had that experience and maybe that's appropriate here mr mccauley so i have not worked in education but i wanted to back <laughs> up what uh, a gentleman over here said so you're know, coming from my corporate experience doing capital expenditure plans not a 50-year time frame but <coughs> 5 10 15 year time frame the short answer is we look at all the options and we roll them all up but we also need to look at the risk benefit profile so the risk here is the time lost um, i think you do have uh, kindergarten that we i think we have a good temporary solution in right now but it's not like a great long-term solution so the opportunity cost is something that we would have to weigh in when we look at that but in general um, you know, I work with all scientists and engineers. We want to see all the data. We want to see all the options. And then usually the best option kind of bumps up or a different option than what we originally thought actually comes out to be the best solution. I, I just can't resist to jump on this opportunity, <laughs> but to your, it was a great question, Dr. Bryson. I, I, I won't speak for my colleague here, but I think the answer would be yes, that you know to explore to think outside of the box and think um, beyond the conventional template of our school system, knowing we have this capacity at two schools, not necessarily a conventional approach to solving, uh, so solving our school building issues, not knowing if there's space, but also being open to gathering information around whether or not, because I too have not seen four schools under one roof, but two, and knowing that that can work, and knowing that, gosh, if that were to be possible, in one building project, we can improve the teaching and learning conditions of six elementary populations in our community. Yes, for an increased cost for the community, even with this new information from the MSBA, we don't know or won't know, depending on how this goes, in terms of what the long-term cost escalations could be down the road for when that other project on the other side of town is completed. Um, so, so the answer is yes, that, you know, uh, it, it, because it was just about exploring and studying. Um, I, I think, I think Don, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Don and I worked together briefly in Needham uh, on the High Rock School. Um, and uh, I was there as a principal at the time, and uh, we had a population issue um, going the other direction. And uh, we uh, inherited a vacant uh, building, uh, the High Rock School, and we had to figure out what to do with a, a, a blossoming middle school population. Um, there was an exercise that brought us to a place in which, um, and still, I believe, stands this, to this day, of um, sending all of the sixth grade students to this vacant building and leaving the seventh and eighth grade students together. Uh, that went through a lot of iterations and a lot of exploration, and boy, uh, initially a ton of resistance by the community. But after careful calculation, we thought that that would be best for a lot of different reasons. Time we don't have to get into those now. Uh, in the end, um, that sixth grade program, and I and I left sh just as it was opening, has been a tremendous success. It was a place in which all sixth grade students from across I forget how many schools or came together under one roof to prepare for their transition to the middle school. And initially, the com there was uh, quite a bit of resistance in the community about that. Um, and in the end, unconventional, a different template for schooling, but one that has worked and continues to work um, uh, very finely. So you never know until you explore it. Can I just add one extra wrinkle to this discussion? <laughs> Maybe that's always dangerous. Um, but it's important to remember that the, you know, um, the district-wide pre-K-5 solution is not the only path to address all of the elementary schools in a shortened time frame. There are other techniques to do that, and we've talked about some of them tonight. <coughs> um, two concurrent projects or one immediately after the other. The important thing to remember with a district-wide solution 
with MSBA's partnership is if it's unsuccessful, you don't get to change your mind and only build half of it. Mm. So if, if you do the study and you end up down that path <clears throat> and the community doesn't support it, you don't have any choices left, right? Where if you were to do, you know, uh, something that's currently under the MSBA's um, options, that sort of two school solution gives you a little more flexibility with um, not only the financial component, but the timing and sequence of addressing the second step. So I just want to sort of remind the, the committee of sort of those two, those two facts. Uh, if there's no objection, I'd like to offer the opportunity for public comment on this, if no one objects. If you. Thank you for having me tonight. I've been to all the meetings now. Uh, can, sorry, for the record, can you please state your name and address? I mean, I know who you are, but. Come on now. There are formalities to be observed. Uh, I've sat through and chaired these meetings and just so Jen knows there is no land we need 20 to 25 acres to build a building that would accommodate uh, uh, acres that would accommodate a building that we want to build and we do not have the land the only alternative we would have to centrally locate a school like that is to eminent domain <clears throat> and I will promise you right now that if the town had att attempted to do that, we would, we would end up in court in litigation for years and years and years, because no one's going to want their property taken. And we don't, it's not where you could say, we have 20 acres here and we only need five so we can grab these three or four houses. Uh, it just won't work, unfortunately. Uh, it was a, it, the concept was good. But when you don't have the most important part, you got to walk away from it. As hard as it is sometimes, you have to walk away. Uh, I like the concept of the two elementary schools. And as we talked on, on uh, the select board in the finance committee last night, let's not sit back now and say, okay, we're going to build this I'm only using this because we no decision has been made yet, but uh, pre-K to five. And uh, don't stop there. Jump right into it. We can be also looking at what else we have to do. But we also have to be very, very, very conscious of the financial end of it. Mm -hmm. Very conscious. The town's paying for, we're, the residents are paying for, a new town hall, school administration building, <clears throat> a senior center. We desperately need a fire substation. Now, you just look at the town hall, school administration building, and the senior center, and we're, we're in the 45, I think around 45 million or so. Uh, we still haven't finished paying for the high school yet. I think that's in 36. If I'm not mistaken, it's uh, in 36 it's paid for. And now we're going to add this on. <coughs> People aren't going, there, there's going to be screaming and hollering when they hear how much this is. We all know that. But in the long run, that's just to clear their throats. I believe they'll support it 100%. Uh, and then the question will be, what else you're going to do? But I would. I would move forward. I would move forward with starting the conversation. Uh, whether it's forming a committee or whether it's just with the uh, school committee starting to talk about what are we going to do on the other side of town and not to make them happy but because they need it mm -hmm. and who needs it the kids mm -hmm. I hear people talking all the time well bop 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 they're talking about this that I never hear the kids the children need it mm -hmm. my grandson went to Wild, Wildwood uh, that would be 14 years ago now. It was a dump then. <laughs> and it's a dump now. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing now is we're paying for past mistakes as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. That the town wasn't forward enough 
to say, we gotta get this done, we gotta get this done now. We gotta get one done at least, so that we don't run into this problem we're running into now. Uh, I wanna thank you. I just wanted to bring that up, especially pertaining to the land, and I did check on it today to make sure that my, my figures were right, and we just don't have it, unfortunately. But now you have to look at it that we have to go to, we have another alternative. And if it's, if it's pre-K to five at the Wildwood, so be it. We're still gonna be uh, uh, shutting down some schools and uh, moving forward. But don't stop there. <clears throat> Get that other <coughs> elementary school, if that's what you're going to look at, mm -hmm. get it going now. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost anything to start the conversation. It's only when you hire the people <laughs> to design it, look into it. Uh, but until then, start the conversation so that everyone understands that we're not forgetting you on the, on the north side, uh, south, uh, west side, excuse me. We're, we're going to be there. But we have to, the main priority was Wildwood. And any, anybody in town that knows the history of Wildwood is not going to argue, number one, because they knew what the school was. And I know it might not be proper etiquette, but it was a dump. <laughs> I felt bad for the administration, the teachers, the students, but everyone knew it in town. So when it came up that we're going to be building a new Wildwood, you didn't hear, I don't see people pounding down doors, picketing, saying no, no, no. I'm hearing just the opposite. But I'm also hearing what are you gonna do for, with the schools on the other side of town? And that's where you step in and you start the conversations going. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I would entertain a motion. I think we're ready to vote on this. If someone would like to make a motion. I don't wanna make a motion. But I do want to say something for oh, then, yes. <laughs> I just wanted to, I, just, I, owe, I think I praise this committee all the time, but just to, I really want to commend all of my colleagues for just really thinking this through, being so thoughtful and so respectful of one another and, and others' opinions, and for participating in so many meetings this week. So, <laughs> and to our leadership team and to, well, the leadership team. <laughs> Thank you. I know, it's been, I know it's been a lot. And so we really do appreciate that you've given us all this information and been so respectful of our of our time. So, thank you. But I'm not making the motion. <laughs> I'll make I'll make a motion. I I, I move to um, I guess uh, forego the expanded option and stay the course, as it were. All right. I think that's clear enough. Do we have a second? Second. All right. So we have a motion from Mr. Fennelly, second by Mr. Turner. Any further discussion? Mr. Smaha. Can I just clarify the yes or no on this? <laughs> I was going to, yes. Yeah, so a yes vote would be stay the course? Yeah, a yes vote means that we do not return to the MSBA and ask to study additional options, that we work with what we currently have. Uh, all right, so we have a motion and a second on the floor. No further discussion. Uh, all in favor? Unfortunately, can, can I can I vote halfway? I'm sort of in between, but I, I just uh, all right. So that uh, all opposed. Uh, all right. So the motion passes five to two with Ms. Bryson and Dr. Bryson and Ms. Burns in opposition. All right. Uh, I think we have some visioning to talk about. <laughs> you guys still? <laughs> so you're not done. No, you don't get to go. Re regard <laughs> We're going to do some that visioning. Was, that, wasn't, yeah. that wasn't the question, was it? Yeah. <laughs> Re regardless of um, uh, the outcome of uh, this and where we're, we currently are, are clearly on a path now, uh, we, we, we wanted to take an, this opportunity just before school comes to an end and, and we take recess for the summer um, to uh, talk about with this committee what the visioning process is because this absolutely is the next step in this very important project. Um, all of this discussion aside, engaging our community around visioning for what schooling will be, at, in this case at the elementary level, for the town of Wilmington for decades to come. So 
Jason, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brand. Um, just to reintroduce myself, I'm Jason Boone. I'm an educational facility planner with Dorn Whittier Architects. I have a background in education. I have a degree in education. I was a high school math teacher before I transitioned into design and architecture. Um, I really enjoy this kind of work and I essentially serve as a bridge between the educator community and the design community. <clears throat> We've been labeling this work visioning, but you'll notice that we have the title on the slide as planning, planning and programming work plan. And part of the difference in nomenclature there is that what we're gonna to describe tonight is some activities beyond just the four visioning sessions that we're talking about because these kinds of projects take more work than just those kinds of meetings to define them, to set them on the right course. So we're gonna to try to briefly describe all of those things. Um, and we encourage you to sort of interrupt us at any time along the way and ask questions. In addition to this slideshow, we did provide a more uh, detailed document um, that describes the activities. Um, and all of it should be considered draft. We're here looking for feedback from you, sort of um, a high level sense uh, that, we're, that we're pointed in the right direction, sort of philosophically and conceptually with this, uh, these sets of tasks. So to sort of start this discussion, visioning and planning a program, right, we're trying to set the direction for the project, define the primary goals, objectives, um, the guiding principles for the project. And while my work will largely be educational, this work will not only be educational, it will include lots of other kinds of topics uh, as well. So tonight we're gonna focus on um, who the participants are, what participant platforms uh, we expect to deploy, what kinds of events we're actually talking about, and then ultimately what the outcomes of this process uh, we hope to be. In terms of participants, I think our objective is to cast a wide net, right? We want to invite people to the table that are representative of the entire community, right? Not just the school committee, not just teachers, not just the north side of town or the west side of town, but the entire community. And this is sort of a theoretical list of people um, that we find helpful to participate um, in this kind of work. Um, and, and not that they're in sort of any priority order, but students are an incredibly important part of this process. Yes, this is, um, an elementary school project, but we found that even at the elementary level, students can have a very strong voice, can often shape the direction of the project uh, based on their experiences, so we think it's really important to include them. Yes? Uh, just one, oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I have a question on that, but do you prefer if I wait till the end of your presentation? No, please. Or, no, or please. Now? Uh, yeah, so uh, this is a really comprehensive list. I'm just kind of wondering um, how do you go about, you know, selecting people? Let's say there's an overwhelming interest. Do you cap? Is there anything else? And with students, um, you know, my daughter's in second grade. She was here tonight. She loved the elevator in the school, so you would get <laughs> feedback like that. You know? um, so in terms of logistics, we would, we would lean on the leadership team to help us shape, you know, how this really works, but some things that we've seen in the past, sometimes we've seen it uh, an invited list, sometimes we've seen it uh, a, a pure open call. Mm -hmm. In fact, in Acton Boxborough, um, we had 80 participants um, rather than the number that we're gonna share in just a mm -hmm. couple of minutes. Um, it's about half that. But um, Doran Whittier is in a position that whatever you decide, whoever you decide um, to allow to participate, we will accommodate them. Okay. okay. All right, thank you. Dr. Brennan, I don't know if you have any No, the, the only that. thing that you might talk about this, I forget, uh, is the, uh, one of the challenges is the consistency piece, though, right? That, um, that for, as will be explained, for these sessions, it really is going to be important to have consistency of representation or, or involvement. Right. Um, and, and so that, in and of itself, may prove to be challenging, but it's not one of those as Jason will explain in a minute, it's not really one of those sessions where people can kind of slide in and out um, because there's a very coherent process from, right. you know, uh, one place to the next on a continuum. And, and so while it's helpful f for people who decide to participate, to participate in each of the, particularly the four visioning activities, um, we're going to work very hard to meet them where they are. So when we talk about the participation formats, we're proposing a number of different ways to engage people, including things like dual sessions or hybrid formats or even remote asynchronous formats so that if someone can't attend a particular meeting at a particular time, there's another opportunity for them to have that continuity of participation throughout the process. Um, 
Mr. Chair, did you have a question or a comment? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Please continue. <clears throat> so typically what we find uh, works really well is a participation group, you know, in the 30 to 40 range. But again, we don't want the district to feel confined to this range if you, you know, uh, reach out to um, people who are interested and it turns out to be a bigger number, you know, Doran Whittier will find a way to accommodate that. Um, often when the number gets bigger, the real challenge becomes the facility that you need um, to have an in-person workshop. <clears throat> but, but we can work with, with a size um, depending on how many people are interested. I was talking about presentation. Uh, participation formats. I'm not sure why that's so. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that was interesting. We have some new uh, tools in our toolkit that we've been using in the last several years now that uh, we can do this in many more ways than just, you know, sort of being in the same room together. There is real value to some of these particular activities for being in the same room, so that would be part of what we propose. But also having the ability for people to participate remotely but at the same time. Um, offering these activities more than once. That's what I mean by dual sessions, perhaps an AM session and a PM session. And there's even some activities um, when we look at uh, sessions three and four uh, where we could potentially um, provide file access to some uh, tools and resources where people could print them at home, you know, do them on their kitchen table with their kids, take pictures of them, upload them to a particular website, and then we would fold that work into our um, synthesis of, of big ideas. So in terms of these platforms, again, this is, this is an effort to reach people where they are. And if there's any sort of feedback about this, if you see any sort of big issues with this, um, we would be interested in hearing that, that feedback. When we're in uh, person, um, obviously the real value in that is you get this sort of live exchange of ideas. And this is just a sort of a representative sample of some of the activities <coughs> that we've done. I mentioned students a little while ago. Just a few weeks ago, we did some visioning sessions around an elementary school in another community, and these fifth graders sort of took over uh, the session. Um, in fact, one of them um, decided that they wanted to be in the design industry when they grew up uh, <laughs> participating in this. So there's real power in being in person, and so we wouldn't want it to, to lose that as a, as a platform for engaging with folks. We also have um, a digital platform called Mentimeter. Um, there's been an interesting phenomenon, uh, maybe more so post-COVID, where people got used to interacting through a device and are now less comfortable speaking their mind in an open format. And so even when we're meeting in person, we tend to use this um, to explore questions so people can respond anonymously. And it sort of... <laughs> it, it, it sort of prevents the soapbox kind of mentality, right? You don't know if there's agreement, but the loudest voice in the room often gets the most attention. Mm -hmm. So this is a, this is a way to, to mitigate that a little bit. And then in our hybrid formats, it's also a way for people to participate um, who are off-site. And this particular platform, part of what's great about it is there's an AI in the background that it analyzes the results in real time, and they sort of show up mm. on the screen, and then we can produce reports from the work uh, to help uh, make decisions as the project moves forward. This is some representative examples of some things that could be sent uh, to people digitally and they could print them at home. I'll just quickly characterize what these are. Um, in the upper left is a set of design patterns that are learning experiences. They're not necessarily related <coughs> to specific spaces, but we often have groups evaluate them for their appropriateness for a particular project. Um, the big circles are sort of overall building diagramming planning tools. The one in the lower left-hand corner is individual space planning tools. And then the one uh, in the lower right is a set of precedent images um, that if we're trying to explore a particular idea, we'll provide folks with examples of that in a built condition somewhere else so that they can sort of um, concretize uh, what their idea is. And then so the kinds of events that we're talking about for this planning and programming segment, particularly in the this first phase, this preliminary design program phase, we would want the design team to go to whatever schools are involved uh, in the project and interview the building principals, walk through them, not with an architectural lens, but with an educational lens, find out what's working really well, find out what's not working so well, um, if there are any early uh, visions for what the project should and be able to do. Um, we talked about 
um, having four visioning sessions. I'll go through those in more detail in just a moment. Um, the preparation of space summaries, for those of you who have been through an MSBA project, this is the document that communicates every single space that goes into the building. Um, and that will be a process to prepare that. That's um, one of the key outcomes that comes out of visioning. And another one is the preparation of the educational program. This is largely the district's responsibility. It's about communicating um, teaching and learning uh, to inform the building project. And so in terms of visioning, we, um, we're talking about four uh, sessions in total. Uh, now that we've made sort of the decision about what grade configurations are on the table, we would likely start this um, late in September uh, in the fall of this year and try to conduct them sort of between the fall of this year and you know sort of before Thanksgiving. Um, but we haven't yet talked about schedule with the district, but that's sort of the, the general time frame. The first one would focus on district-wide planning, some of the issues that we've talked about. Um, the second one would focus on teaching and learning. Uh, the third one would focus on overall planning for the building, and the fourth one would, would um, focus on individual space planning. It's this idea of sort of going from the broadest set of issues down to the smallest set of issues. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you're going to get here, and if you are, just ignore it. But the, the Visioning 2 one, which talks a lot about learning and teaching, there's a lot of that that the wide group of participants, there's knowledge for lack of a better way, industrial knowledge of what education should do and should, would look like. And mm -hmm. some people in the room know very well, and some of the people oh, in the room won't, aren't educators mm -hmm. or aren't in, in education. Is there an element of give, giving people the, the knowledge before they get into that conversation to actually be, uh, be helpful and productive in that conversation? Because particularly that one vision set of the four visioning seems like the one where the most germane knowledge is going to be held by the least number of people in that long participant list. It's, it's, a, it's a terrific comment. And I think in my experience, it's been that people read that particular visioning session as, I need uh, you know, an ED, uh, a doctorate in education, to be able to participate in that conversation. But I think tonight's school committee uh, is a good demonstration of that that's not necessarily true. Right? The students that came in tonight they're saying, wow, this, is, right, this, um, this externship experience was really great. We want school to be more like that. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of conversations that will happen in that moment. Right? We might talk about um, how the school schedule works. We might talk about um, authentic learning versus you know, direct teaching. Um, what does the learning experience look and feel like? And we've got some tools that um, make it easy for the, the lay person to, to engage in those conversations. I mentioned those design patterns um, a little while ago. Um, but I, even though it's, it feels like you might need to be an educational expert to participate in those, we've been successful in facilitating those conversations with people who aren't educators at the table and them still contributing in a very, really valuable way to that discussion. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that in Acton Boxborough because we did sort of exactly that. Yeah, the, the, the experience of thinking specifically at the elementary level in this case, um, you know, brings a, uh, an opportunity for parents, guardians of young children, of children themselves, of educators to um, provide ideas that they would love to see um, in, in, you know, in a future building that often is is given rise to by limitations in the current buildings mm -hmm. you know such things as wouldn't it be great to learn outdoors at times wouldn't it be great to have classrooms that have more flexible space at times because we can bring together two classrooms like those kind of ideas surface and not as just as, as Jason is saying they and they sometimes surface not from the educators necessarily but from uh, uh, from those others that are involved in the conversations yeah and, and um it's always enjoyable when those kinds of topics come up and they can inform the project in a way that they might not have if they hadn't been at, you know, at the table. Uh, oops, wrong button. So in terms of uh, timing, right now we're proposing for the first session to be the longest one because it, you know, um, it needs some context presentations. It needs enough breathing room to have discussion and then reporting out about that discussion. And sort of what we're proposing there is a four-hour session where each one is hybrid, but we're doing it twice, again, to try to reach as many people as possible. Uh, same thing with the second session, but a little shorter time based on the agenda items that we have. 
identified at the, at the moment. And then the last two are sort of in that two hour range um, where it's a more of a workshop format. We're actually going to be drawing things and building things and you know playing with um, physical materials. And so this is where we might make those, um, we would suggest making those materials available to people so that they can pr you know, print it at their home computer and you know, cut them out and, and work on those uh, at their leisure and then send the results um, through photography uh, into, a, into a website. Yes. I have a quick question. So when you say in, um, in the Visioning 1 that uh, hybrid, per, you know, with synchronous and parentheses, so mm -hmm. is that like a hybrid, like in-person, remote, but all synchronous? What do you mean by hybrid? So by hybrid, I mean people sitting elsewhere can experience exactly the same thing that's happening in the room. So we'd be broadcasting live through um, probably through Microsoft Teams or some, some platform like that. Um, so that people can visually see the resources, they can hear the conversation, and when we mix that with the Mentimeter platform, right, they can engage in the conversation um, just like everybody else in the room. Um, we use the word synchronous um, versus asynchronous, where we might do um, a, a recording of a meeting and someone could watch that at their own leisure, but it's much mm -hmm. harder for them to participate in real time, so that's why we put the sort of synchronous. Okay, so but of this, actually, it was more about the the hybrid. So this is like of those forty people, some of them are present in person in the room, and some of others them can just be watching. That's correct. Uh, there's a remote. Okay, that's correct. Yep, and we'll have to establish norms for you know how the how we engage with the people to make sure they have the same sort of experience that the people are having uh, live in the room. So in terms of the basic agendas for each one of these, again, all of these are are up for discussion, but when we talk about district-wide planning issues, um, we would be, we would be, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, we would be talking about things like transitions, right? We'd be talking about things like grade configuration, school size, school count, and so we have some <coughs> activities crafted around those particular activities. Um, you see um, things related to the teaching and learning process, educational intent, and learning experiences, and again, we've got um, several tools available to, to guide those discussions. And then I mentioned um, earlier what the what the last two sessions were, but um, the session three is gonna end in a set of guiding principles where tabletops will say, this is what we want the project to do. We've had you know two and a half sessions now, and sort of here's the list of things that you should always refer back to uh, as the project moves forward. And then uh, session four, um, the big idea is to separate people into specialties, right? Mostly by department, classroom teachers or people interested in um, health and physical education, physical education or student dining or sustainability. Um, and they're gonna communicate some details about what they need spatially so that we can size them appropriately uh, right from the very beginning uh, in those space summaries I mentioned earlier. And so out of all of this work, there's sort of three uh, big outcomes um, the educational program narrative, which we would hope would be informed by this, that's largely written by the district um, with the design team's review. A set of overall planning diagrams, right? Those are the things that will ultimately lead to the different concepts. They get tested on the various sites. Um, and then a space summary, which is what um, ultimately all of those concepts will need to have in terms of individual spaces. So pause there for any additional questions. Mr. Regaldi. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, nice overview. So uh, regarding the work plan and the session details, I'm a little concerned that these sessions need to cover a significant amount of information and need decisions maybe in a timely basis um, with a fairly large group of people. I was just wondering if you could maybe speak to how this process has worked in your past and how maybe you've overcome that perceived challenge that I have. Yeah, I think it's important to communicate to everybody who's involved sort of right from the beginning that this visioning group is not a decision-making group. They're an information-gathering group. And so typically what we'll do is we'll document everything that comes out of each one of these visioning sessions, so try to synthesize that, and then put that in front of the leadership team first and then in front of the school building committee to make sure that we're digesting the information correctly and that everybody sort of agrees with what's come out of those. So it's sort of that three-step process of documentation, 
synthesis, and then you present those sort of outcomes to uh, the various groups who are in a decision-making capacity. Does that, does that answer your question? It does. Yeah, thank you. And then just a comment. So a question I did have was about how you prevent the loudest voice in the room, and I'm glad to hear you have a mitigation against that. So that's great to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Smaha? I, I, think, I think my question might be, might be the same. So I, I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm totally understanding this. So at the end of this visioning process, right, mm -hmm. there's, you, there's going to be a presentation to the boards, is there a recommendation? So I guess what my question is, let me step back for a second. We have like those three different scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. Pre-K, K, pre-K to three, pre-K to five. Mm -hmm. All of those three options are explored as part of the visioning process. Mm -hmm. And what will come out of that is the pre-K to K school would look like this and have these elements. The pre-K to three would have these elements pre K to five would have these elements? Almost, but not quite to that level of granularity. Okay. So because of the way the MSBA process is constructed, we try to conduct visioning so that the outcomes will apply to the entirety of options being explored. So in this case, we've got multiple grade configurations. And in that first session, we're talking about um, pre-K, K, pre-K three, pre-K five. And the group, that participant group, will evaluate those and render sort of an opinion about those, but no decisions will be made even when we make this first submission about those grade configurations. Instead, when it comes time to make that decision, the, um, the leadership team, the school building committee, can point to the outcomes of the visioning group and say, there was a clear preference for this. This is what the options look like for that. Therefore, we're going to go in this particular direction. So that group isn't sort of um, making any recommendations. They're not um, pointing the project in any particular way. They might be expressing a preference based on the analysis they do in the workshop, but it's actually the decision of others to hear that and then choose what to do with it, if that, if that makes sense. Okay, so just to, to follow up with that. So the, a presentation will be made concerning all of those, all those things that you just said. Um, and then those boards would be tasked with determining what is the best solution. Co correct. Based on that information. Correct. Yep. And so how that might manifest itself um, in many of our other projects, that that process to choose either the perf the short list of options or ultimately the preferred option is through a set of evaluation criteria. And so, for example, you might have an evaluation criteria that says preferred grade configuration and the, the, the leadership team and the school building committee has defined that as we've reached out to people their preference is this and therefore we're going to score that this way does that does that yep. make clear uh, I have a couple of two, two questions one which is kind of following on from Jay's question making <laughs> just making sure that I understand because you um, so you talked about that the the, the order of the visioning goes from the general down to the specific, that you mm -hmm. sort of look at the big picture. But it, um, it doesn't seem that the options get narrowed at all as you go along, like that there are no, de yeah. there are no decisions made at the beginning that then say, well, now we're going to look at this in the next stage rather than something else. That at each point, everything, like all, th as you said, all three options are kind of being looked at and studied at, e at each stage. Is right, so, so, let it, so let us be clear about that process. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, visioning is a thing that sort of defines the project. It doesn't pick the preferred project. There's a series of public meetings that will take place, other steps that are sort of outside the visioning work. We're not asking this group, this visioning group, to pick the preferred options, right? That'll happen as part of the public meeting process, uh, sort of outside the visioning work. So and, unless you provide that feedback to us and say, yeah, l let's invite this group to weigh in on those kinds of decisions, that's not currently folded into this particular scope. Uh, so, so when you talk about like in the district-wide planning in that first meeting, uh, that grade configuration is discussed. Now that's obviously going, you know, a big thing, and that's kind of the whole issue of whether it's a pre-K to K, mm -hmm. pre-K to three, or pre-K to five. Uh, so, I mean, are, 
I mean, we already know that those are the options under consideration. So what does it mean to then vision and describe those? Like, are we looking at, are they looking at pros and cons it, it, of those different possibilities, but then just, you know, putting down like, you know, we think that this has this, the trade-offs for this are X and Y and Z, and the trade-offs for this other option are A, B, and C, and then all of that is just available later down the line. Do I have that right? Exact, exactly right. And, and what we find is, you know, those of us who have been thinking about this for a while already have formed sort of a disposition about that. But when we invite a wider group in, right, they need the time in the, the process to, um, to digest that for themselves. And so through these activities, they're documenting what they think the advantages and disadvantages of certain options are and expressing preferences that extend well beyond those of us sitting at the table right now. And so that would be the key outcome there is to simply to give others an opportunity to think about that particular grade configuration question and then um, provide an opinion for others to, to synthesize and digest outside that, that first visioning session. And is there any discussion of cost at that point? Because that would be one of the major trade-offs between smaller versus larger schools. So I'll look to Julie to, to add to this. <laughs> but um, it, When we talk about cost at this early stage, it's often to talk about this one is cheaper, that one's in the middle, and that one's the most expensive, and not get into sort of specific dollar amounts, right? Smaller projects obviously cost less. Larger projects obviously cost more. But what might happen is we start talking about, um, if we're talking about both sides of town, is it um, cheaper or more expensive to do two schools at the same time or to do them staggered? And we, we, we could talk about them in those broad terms, but we, we wouldn't get into specific dollar amounts at this, mm -hmm. sure. at this stage of the process. Mr. Turner. So, oh, oh, unless, do, you, do you want to comment on them? Oh, I was just going to you know, say in, in conjunction to that, people may ask, you know, is it a renovation? less you know less expensive as an addition less with a renovation less expensive you know and those are kind of those ongoing conversations about well if you add an addition onto a building that triggers code so that means the whole building has to be really upgraded so you know it is never our job to steer you in a direction it's really about what you're looking for as a whole but we can only offer the valuable advice over the course of the year. And the MSBA does have on their website numerous documents that can show you the costs associated with you know, new buildings, the square footage. I mean, they have data since 2006, mm -hmm. I think, or something. So there's plenty of data out there for us to look at. Um, one thing I would like to sort of piggyback off, but not make anyone confused. <laughs> Try not to confuse anyone. But this is a really wonderful process, which brings communities together, different groups, students, and everyone, where everyone gets to give their input. And it's, you know, I, one visiting session I went to, some child said, I want a heliport on the roof. We were <laughs> like, okay, put it on the board. You know, we all knew we would have to put a heliport on it. But it was his vision. He, can, you know, thought, wouldn't that be great? Someday we could just fly to school. Um, <laughs> And, and so we don't Traffic take, problems. there's nothing that is too small. Those you know, we, we, mm -hmm. we really could, could use those. But as part of the process, once we get through visioning and they collect all the data and they start putting together, you know, what the school could look like and they give you multiple options, we have to submit to the MSBA multiple options. We have to show them what just a renovation would look like. We have to show them what an addition renovation would and what a new school, and that that we've done our due diligence on all of it. And so they take all this data and they show it. And once we get further down, you know, you put your first submission, and you, you get further down, we get to the PSR. That's our preferred schematic report. That's where we've narrowed it down from all those options to this is what we want. And they take all of these building blocks that they came up with in these meetings and all of the information that was provided, and they say, okay, what's the most important thing? and you get people safety, right? When we think about a school these days, safety. Right? I'm just using that as a parent, right? So, so they start envisioning it and they start putting it together and, they, you know, and people say, well, well, is it safe? Yeah, well, look, we, we design kind of, we always say it's like just square boxes all put together at first, but there's no walls or you know, electrical outlets and things like that. But the safety of it, right? Oh, yep. Look, we, we did, we designed it like this. What are your thoughts? 
And it's all of the information that Jason gets from all of you that helps create that space. And it's really, really important, and it's a really, really, really cool opportunity to be part of something. So I just, I'm going to heliport with another one. <laughs> Urals on walls, you know. I've seen that done, and, you know, it's... So. No? <laughs> Mr. Turner. So, I, I, to be honest, I don't know where this question fits, and it could be in the, the MSBA scope, it could be in the visioning, it could be in the post-visioning piece. One of the things this district has focused a lot on over the last many years is bringing as many children as possible into the district who have special needs as opposed to taking them out of the district. So when we talk about the scope of 755 students, mm -hmm. that's based on a current capacity for handling different special education needs. Can we, is it part of the <coughs> MSBA scope to say yes, no to that? Or is it part of the vision that we wanna continue with that path? Or is it part of the, after we get there, we and we're actually designing the building, we say, well, we, we would want to have these extra spaces to do new things. I don't, I don't, where does that go? Um, the location for that conversation would be envisioning session number two. In our experience, um, the MSBA and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education have been incredibly supportive of special education programming. And so the MSBA will view this from a space perspective. Um, yes, 755 students, that will be the enrollment that won't change. But if we want to design in spaces to support special education students that will attend this building that aren't being served by the district, they're being served by you know, um, other um, entities, we can include them in the project and the MSBA will weigh in on whether or not they're eligible or not. Um, in my experience, there's been very few circumstances, even like the one that you're describing, where the MSBA has said, no, we're not going to participate in that special education space. I think I would probably venture to guess we're all relatively in the same age bracket of where we went to school. When we all went to school, special education was in like a remote part of the building. They kept them all there. The MSBA has really, really, really um, done a great job of working with all of us to bring special education in, in inclusive areas. Mm -hmm. So they don't just say, okay, if this is a classroom wing and there's three classrooms, they're on the end. They bring them into the middle so that they all feel like they, they're included. Uh, so I just want to make sure that, you. you know, we took take special education, ADA requirements, all of that extremely seriously, mm -hmm. um, and we, we make it a focus of what we do um, so that everyone feels mm -hmm. included okay. in, the, in the process. So you've, uh, you've indicated that um, several times that we need to study like all three ways we might improve the schools, the you know, new construction, addition, reno, re you know, reno addition, I forget how that, what the phrasing is, but the, the, we have to look at those possibilities. Doesn't that radically change the way that you can do your visioning in all those possibilities? I mean, if you were looking at the Wildwood and just sort of saying like, okay, well, new school construction. Well, now the sky is the limit. It's just like, all right, tear down that building and let's get a modern educational facility in its place. And uh, you know, what's you know, what what's the, what's the best we can do now? Whereas if you were said just like, all right, well, you need to renovate the Wildwood, and then you'd be like, well, my vision is, it's not terrible <laughs> somehow, and. Um, well, I mean, that, uh, to say, how, do, how, do you, how do you have to do that a, in all three situations? It's a, it's a terrific question, and I think our approach is one of let's collectively agree on what the ideal is, right? And then it's the challenge of the design team to realize that ideal in all three of those scenarios. And then what will likely happen is certain options will perform better than other options. And then that becomes part of that evaluation criteria process. How well did the option we're looking at perform relative to educational issues? Repair probably not very well because we're not, you know, moving walls around. We're not making the building bigger. We're not putting an addition on it. Addition and renovation, maybe, right? There's an awful lot that you can do with existing buildings if you're willing to, you know, consider it a blank slate, right? And then obviously um, a new a new construction is a blank piece of paper, but 
that I think that's our typical approach is that we want to define what the ideal is and then the design team would work to prepare options to meet that knowing that some options are going to be more successful than others. Does the MSBA ever like steer districts towards one of those options? Like we have to study them all, but do we then have free choice of what we pick? Or do they exercise influence there? Typically, yes. Uh, the district has you know, full license to evaluate the options against criteria that they define themselves and make a selection based on what they think is best for their local conditions. The phrase that the MSBA uses is, educationally appropriate and cost effective. They're looking for the most educationally appropriate and cost effective solution. We've seen in many districts where it's not the cheapest solution and it's not the most expensive solution, but it's sort of somewhere in the middle to satisfy that, that basic criteria of educationally appropriate and cost effective. But I don't, I don't know of very many, if any, circumstances where the MSPA has said, thou shalt do this. Or thou shalt not do this. Right. Mm -hmm. Then yeah, then thank you. I, no, I, the, um, the intention, uh, as you heard, right, the, the interest here was to provide you as a school committee with insight in terms of this process, that over the summer, uh, as you mentioned, Jason, Jason mentioned, we, we need to be positioning ourselves to get, and we haven't defined dates, but to get this process up and running well before, I would imagine, the end of September, or bef sometime before the end of September. We clearly are going to need to engage in a campaign to figure out what our target or desired um, participation is. The groups are mentioned there. It's going to take a while. It'll be the summer to reach out to interested parties and probably have to reach out again and figure out strategies to do so. But we clearly need to pe have people involved and we need to have them available for these dates that we'll pick ahead of time. So uh, it, it's my thought to certainly work on this over the summer so that we are arriving back to the first part of September, if not September 1st, with a clear defined slate of participants um, and dates and ready to go because we know that the beginning of, of school is busy, but we need to get this group uh, positioned because we do have a time element uh, to keep moving through the process here and, and that's why we need to make sure that we're in place here. So. Um, this will be presented as well to the Wildwood Building Committee at the meeting scheduled next week. They obviously uh, have an instrumental role in all of this, and we'll provide the same information to them next week as well. So, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> I think we'll good. see you tomorrow. Uh, haven't had enough. Would you, like to, would you like to stay? Can we meet up somewhere tomorrow and just do it again? <laughs> Should, should we tell them when our meeting is in August? <laughs> <laughs> Four days in a row. Um, I'd like to suggest a five-minute recess um, to the committee. Uh, all right, so we have a motion for recess. Second for Mr. Turner. All in favor? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm not in favor, but feel free. <laughs> uh, sorry, I actually that thought that was going to be now, but all right, all those in favor? I need an actual vote count there. Uh, all right, the motion passes. I'm not five. in favor. I'm opposed. <laughs> I'll go seven. right there because if I had known this three minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was the, the biggest.
Yep, we are back. Okay. All right, school committee has just returned from recess, and next on our agenda, item D, uh, the strategic plan. Dr. Brand. Thank you. Uh, in, in your packet are two items uh, relative to this. Uh, first, a, a cover memo in which uh, we've tried, uh, Ms. Elliott and I have tried to capture sort of the salient uh, developments that we think have brought us to this point in time, uh, paying attention to sort of where we, we began, the, the process of our efforts to engage the community. Uh, you can see the full stakeholder committee member list. And as you know, uh, in the end, we were able to, with uh, uh, the help of, of many expand the uh, involvement of um, many many folks in this process a reiteration for uh, the, the process the dates that brought us to this point in time and before you is what we're what we're terming a draft of the next strategic plan for the Wilmington Public Schools um, I know that uh, some of this committee of course have been involved with this and you've seen some uh, some uh, some of this in advance sort of a preview uh, that we have discussed and shared with you previously but we think that it's at a point in which it is and should be considered a draft before you. Um, as noted in the plan, um, this includes uh, sort of a, a, an overall model, I guess, if you will, that is similar to our current plan. And But what I mean by that is it includes a mission that you can see there, a vision, uh, the core values, and the theory of action. Um, I just want to pause on that before we get to the other uh, parts of this. Um, with, with the uh, the efforts of our facilitator and those that were involved in the process, there wasn't a lot of time spent, um, but some, on uh, taking a look back at our current mission, vision, core values, and theory of action, and uh, efforts in terms of trying to assess whether or not the members of this group felt like those still held true, still represented what uh, we believe as an educational community is important for each of those areas. Um, as pointed out in the uh, in the cover memo, um, largely speaking, those have remained the same and are here uh, as part of this plan um, that really do resemble those that are part of our, what was the 2019-2022 strategic plan. Um, the uh, the theory of action, though, um, has been modified or or revised, I guess, if you will. Um, there was some input and discussion on that, and you can see um, what that uh, currently sits at. Uh, as part of this draft. The, um, obviously, though, the heart of the plan uh, is what follows, and that is the strategic objectives, of which, as you can see there, there are five. All students reach their fullest potential. Caring and safe for all is objective number two. Equitable and inclusive schools, three. Objective four is enhanced and updated school facilities, and five, we are one community. And what follows under that, as is, as is pointed out, um, are uh, a variety of initiatives, strategic initiatives. Um, since the last time we had this before you as a draft, Ms. Elliott uh, and I have worked through also trying to take careful consideration of the feedback that we have received uh, most recently in the process, that uh, the results of the survey were included, right, correct, right, Ms. Elliott, in the, in the packet mm -hmm. as well. Um, we didn't. Um, we worked off of that and made some suggested revisions that we tried to capture here in this draft plan before you, and we tried to capture those both in the memo as well as the plan itself. We thought there was some redundancy in a couple of the uh, initiatives as last written, and so we tried to collapse some of those or realign some of those. But by and large, um, very few uh, revisions that we're presenting to you uh, for your consideration tonight. The hope is that this can be considered, this presentation tonight can be considered a first read, if you will, similar to um, how we approach ultimately uh, the committee's approval of other things. And it's, um, it's our hope that uh, with any discussion and suggestions and such here tonight, we can take that back if, you, if there's a will of the committee to make some changes, but then bring it back for you for a second read and approval at the last meeting in June. I think it's important to point out that what is not here uh, are specific, specific action steps, specific measurable aspects of these initiatives or time frames or people responsible for these initiatives. But it's our thought that um, what would be first and foremost important is to get uh, your approval as a committee of both the objectives and the initiatives. And then, as mentioned in the memo, 
over the course of the summer, uh, Ms. Elliott and I will work closely with members of our, uh, of our uh, district leadership team to establish those action steps and timelines and so on. You think, did I forget anything? That's it. All right. So with that, uh, thank you for all of your time as we've, we've talked about this previously. Again, thank you to members of this committee who have been a part of this process. And we uh, truly do welcome any thoughts, uh, feedback, or suggestions mm -hmm. you have. Dr. Bryson. I just have one, I have a, one question under enhanced and updated school facilities based on our conversation tonight. I don't know if I see anything specific to long-term planning. So I see partner with MSBA, mm -hmm. but I don't see in anything else specific to what we've just spent all that time talking mm -hmm. about. Very good point. So I just thought maybe that might <laughs> yeah. be something to put in there. Excellent comment. Ms. Burns? Um, I just wanted to comment that um, in reading through the revisions um, with the redacted included, I do like how they're, I, I, I find them to be a lot clearer in expectation. Um, and so I really do appreciate the enhancements um, that were done um, on it. Thank you. Mr. Fennelly? I'll just make the comment that I, I, uh, I think this is great. I'm happy. Uh, with where this is at for the first read, I, I echo Dr. Bryson's comment. Um, and I, I was particularly happy to see this 2.2, um, which sort of focuses on mental health and counseling. And, and um, you know, I know we've talked a lot in this room about that, and I, I'm glad to see it reflected in this plan. So thank you for that. Thanks for that feedback. Mr. Smaha? Yeah, I just. Um, I have a question um, on the on the process of this. This all looks um, fantastic <coughs> to me. Um, so I guess my, my my question is, this will get brought back to us to vote on. Mm -hmm. One of the I like where this is going. I am not sure that each one of these initiatives is necessarily um, always measurable. Um, so, you know, f you know, for example, um, uh, there's, there's one, like one point, uh, I guess, it's, you know, 1.4, enhance the integration of social emotional learning competencies into daily instruction. I don't, I don't necessarily know what that, I mean, I know what it could mean. There's, I think there's a lot of different interpretations of that. So without knowing how it's going, what the, like, the measurable objectives are, and I know that's going to be the next step, um, is, is that level going to, when this gets back to us, are we going to know what those sort of more measurable objectives are, or are we just approving, like, the, the more higher level um, strategic initiatives? I guess that's my question. Does that make sense? Well, Sure. Well, I think the, um, so it's sort of, um, we're in that uh, difficult place in that there's a lot of work that will take place to really map out, every, you know, an action plan for every initiative. So we went through with the lens multiple times having the dialogue without going through that whole step. What would our action plan look like for that? Do we have a solid action plan for that? We eliminated some of these based on the fact that we both said that's actually redundant of the other action plan we just talked about. But we felt at, at in a discussion phase that we had a solid action plan that we could develop for every one of these initiatives with um, you know uh, clear benchmarks and, and ways to measure it and who's responsible. Um, so I think what we were looking for at this point is really the sense of the committee, shall we continue to um, really delp, you know, develop these with the input of the entire leadership team? Because you know it was sort of the two of us saying, yes, we think we know really where we want to go with this, but there's also a lot of other people who are part of this plan development that we want to get their input um, as far as the specifics of the action steps. Um, so it's, you know, I think at this point, um, we really want to know, are these the objectives and initiatives that you want us to continue to move forward with? 
Um, the work we would do would be over the course of the summer. We'd be bringing this back in August or September, whenever that meeting is, mm -hmm. which could be then the final vote, I guess, um, at that right. point. But that was really what we were thinking. And I think, and I think the other thing to point out is, as much as this is a longer term plan, I, I have to believe that everyone around this table would agree that we can't just be seeking your vote of a committee on a on a one time basis for a five year plan. Mm -hmm. That this will be there'll be a, some degree of fluidity. We still have to have a plan. I mean, in some respects, I'm actually envisioning this to be along the course of a of a school improvement plan in the sense of perhaps, and I'm not suggesting necessarily on a year-to-year -year basis, but maybe, right? If conditions change, if factors change, and we need to adjust some of the action steps that fall underneath each of these initiatives, certainly something we would want the committee to weigh in on. Uh, let me rephrase that. Certainly what's want the committee to approve of, because part of this could involve budgetary resources, uh, certainly in some way, shape, or form, and this to me seems um, uh, in, in, inherently important that as a committee you are on board with and approving you know a anything that falls under actionable steps that are measurable and going to take time and, and energy and, and resources so uh, Dr. Bryson just one quick question on 1.2 I'm just like I'm fine with it but I'm just not sure use data to guide instructional decision making and identify areas where students need appropriate levels of challenge I keep wanting to see challenge like and support. Can you explain? I'm assuming it was, I just, I'm trying to move mm -hmm. back in time and be like, wait, <clears throat> why wouldn't it say that? Is that because it's sort of like after MTSS? Can you? I think the, um, the intent of this initiative stemmed from our discussions around MTSS where we talked so much about providing interventions for students who needed remediation or additional support to reach the learning target, but we were not in the in the launch of MTSS at the elementary grades. Our, that has been our primary focus and not looking at the students who are easily attaining the, the basic standard, but could certainly be stretched well beyond that. So it was really about looking at um, student needs, MTSS meeting the needs of all students, but having a new emphasis and a particular focus on those who need to be further challenged beyond what the core curriculum is providing. So I think that was the, so I mean, I don't, I don't think adding the word and support would make it different in the sense that, I mean, it would still be fine to add that if that was something that would help clarify, um, but that was the intent, I think, behind that initiative. Well, Mr. Turner, or do you want to just quickly reply to that? Yeah. Well, I'm just my hang up here is I understand the 1.1, but there's no mention of, of data there. But then there's this mention, so I'm kind of like, ooh, it doesn't feel like we're like I want to make sure that so either we're using data to then help with that MTS and we're using data, so it just feels a little something feels a little off to me. I don't know how to fix it, but something feels a little off to me there. Would it make more sense to merge 1.1 and 1.2 and just specify that it's for both? You know, using no, no, I, I don't think so because then I think you're losing the purpose. It's watered of that. down but, a little so, bit. So, and maybe I'm alone here, but maybe adding and support, I don't know, or adding a data piece to 1.1 to 1. You know what I mean? 1.1, 1. 1. okay, yeah. being more explicit about the data on 1.1. I think it, have, it could also, I mean, it says appropriate levels of challenge, but I think what we're really talking about is greater challenge. Uh, because when I first read that, I had to kind of try to parse that and just like, wait, so what would we say appropriate like? And then it's like, well, that's not for people who need additional, like we wouldn't say, like, we wouldn't describe support or remediation as, oh, you need an appropriate lesser level of challenge. Uh, so I kind of then mm -hmm. interpreted it just saying, okay, so we're talking about people uh, who you know, can handle something more, but maybe it should just say that more explicitly if that's what we mean. If the, I mean, if we have one for tiered support and then we intend for this one to be identifying students who can handle something more challenging, maybe it should say that. Okay. Sorry, it's very unlike <laughs> me, Mr. Turner, I'm sorry. My, <laughs> or, my concern there is this, these buckets of students who need, students who need additional support are in this MTSS bucket students who need rigor and challenge are in this different bucket. Like, I, there could be children who need tiered support in a particular subject, right? 
And there can be children that <clears throat> still need tiered support, but also need a challenge and rigor in a different subject. So Agreed. I just want to be careful Agreed. that we're not bucketing it. I guess that's my fear here. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? So I hear you, but I, that's my fear. No, I mm -hmm. think that's a, a good point. Mr. Turner. Um, two different things. One, in the preparation of the action plans for the fall, clearly this number of initiatives can't be handled. You're not going to have an action plan in September of 2023 to deal with all these initiatives. Can there be a secondary document that it, at a high level of envisions when in the five years things fall out? Yes. Obviously not set in stone mm -hmm. as you get the end of year one. Things shift and change, but that could be a revised document as the action plans revise over the five Th years. That's as well. absolutely what the vision is, okay. my vision okay. of, of mm -hmm. what we would be able to build here for you. Okay. And then the one other thing I wanted to say is more of a comment. I appreciate um, the, the objectives one through three, how they bring together the different pieces of um, the student and the children we're trying to educate and understanding, recognizing, and this is in some way the comment for the, the community as well, that, that academic rigor and academic learning do rely on students who are ready and available to learn mentally, socially, even in, in all the different aspects of, of themselves, that if you've got a child who has the potential to be super academically achieving, but has a significant challenge with their mental health or feels very ostracized from the school, they're not gonna get there. And I like the way the three of them work together to really understand and, and, and acknowledge that we do need to be aware of all those different aspects. Um, and, and that helps, if we're able to do all that, hopefully does help the students re reach their full potential, the first one, but they all kind of play together that way. And, and, may I, and I think that they really tightly align with what continues to remain um, important for our educational community, and that's our mission, mm -hmm. right? The mission that was developed some five years ago, you know, Wilmington Public Schools is to educate and develop students academically, socially, and emotionally to be active, civic-minded contributors to our global society. I think that those are a close and clear tie, and that this process has affirmed this direction for, for our school system um, and those particular aspects, which I, I think is wonderful to see. So. Uh, Mr. McCauley. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I just want to take a step back. I, I do like the plan. I think a lot of the stuff in there is great. Um, I also do like how it's kind of making more of that well-rounded student, you know, the SEL inclusion with the academics, I think is really fantastic. Um, so it, I, I went through this and I have a lot of feedback so I don't know if I should just kind of rapid fire through it or if there's a better way to do it you know um, so objective one um, so one thing I, I, I noticed was in the objective but not too much in the initiatives was we kind of talk about academic um, achievement in the objective but it wasn't much of a mention in the in all of the initiatives down below and I was wondering if um, some things could be reworded to kind of like tie that back into the higher level objective um, and then if there's anything a little bit more specific we would want to add in there so for example things I've heard is you know increasing like stem activities in the district um, better alignment of education processes across the elementary schools um, connecting current academic curriculum with kind of regional national job market something like that um, so that, that'll be my first question well, so if the I mean, ultimately, again, I come back to uh, the fact that we want to have a plan before this committee that you can uh, support and, and agree and, and are in agreement with. Um, this is meant truly to be, uh, you know, an opportunity for that kind of feedback. And if if it's certainly easier to uh, to, to share that, you know, in written form, we, we certainly can do that. But we okay. can. We can take a look at that and make any, any, ultimately, it is your plan and the modifications that you'd wish to see here, um, you know, I, I think it's appropriate to, at this time, to consider those and, okay. and we can, as, some, as we're taking notes here, bring something back to you as a committee um, sure. at the end of the month w w in an effort to try and capture those revisions, so. Okay. Um, we, we can, we can do it. Sounds good. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning here too, so. Um. Okay, great. And then uh, thinking about objective three, um, I liked everything that was in there. I thought it was really good and well thought out. 
And one thing I was wondering is if we wanted to be a little bit more specific. So something I was thinking about was um, neurodiversity. So there's not really a good mention of like special needs students like anywhere in the plan. And I was wondering if the neurodiverse population could be captured here in objective three a little bit more, um, just to make sure we continue to have as a focus for the, the district. Uh, the other thing I was wondering too was you know, if we want to um, talk about socioeconomic equity as well, too. Um, so how, how the district could implement initiatives that can help students who are from economically disadvantaged households, you know, or if that's already in the plan. So the, those are just two additions I think I would um, like to consider. Uh, just, could you just repeat that last one? Like yeah. the, it's, I mean, economic diversity, but there's something else you said around that just... Um, so can socioeconomic equity be added here as well, more specifically about how the district can implement initiatives that can help students who are from economically disadvantaged households? Thank you. Yep, no problem. Uh, moving on, objective four, I think Jen kind of mentioned something about this earlier in the conversation. I was wondering if we can add town government to this initiative um, in 4.1, and the rationale is that we're going to need to work with the select board and the finance committee to get this job done, right? And I think giving them a nod here will be good and kind of setting the tone that this is really a team effort. Great, thank you. Yeah, and last one. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me. So I, I don't know if this would be appropriate for the plan, and this was just like a big, big picture idea, was for Objective 5, can this objective be used as an opportunity to engage with the larger regional business and or academic community to work with our students and schools? So example is, could the district continue to and or begin to engage with local institutions to develop enrichment programs for STEM, arts, you know, so be it. Yeah, I, I thought it was great hearing from the high school earlier today about this kind of internship program and, you know, these, these senior projects. So just a few ideas, right? You know, um, we're really, like we're really fortunate to live in the greater Boston area. I mean, we have such a wealth of higher education um, institutions here, great great um, business to, um, hub for like tech, biotech, so many other industries. And I'm just wondering if we as a district could leverage that at all. Um, you know, could we work with local tech or biotech companies on student intern programs? You know, how great would it be if someone wanted to go enter um, into a, you know like engineering field or biological sciences they can do a three-month co-op at a local biotech company or you know if they want to be a programmer I mean Amazon's right in North Reading Amazon Robotics right that'll be awesome um, engaging with local universities to set up programs to get our students interested in certain fields of study I, I went to graduate school at Tufts and we had some high school students come in our labs and academic institutions love to get people in, you know, just to work in the labs and teach them and everything like that, too. Um, and then reaching, you know, reaching out to maybe regional artistic institutions, too. I mean, because not everyone's doing science, right? You know, people are in the arts, and we, we have, you know, um, a lot of those as well, and maybe they can help us reach our enrichment goals, too. Could we get something like BSO or some more regional thing to come in and, you know, do a day with the string students, you know? That would be pretty cool. Um, so yeah, just thinking big. Don't know if it's viable, don't know how viable it is, but that was just something I was thinking about. Can I just sure. ask a clarifying question? Yeah. Um, so you're just, so you're talking about 5.2, so is that what you're saying? Like the uh, initiative 5.2, so our action plan is what you're referring to, right? Yeah, something okay. like that. Yeah, and I don't know if that would be tied well, into Well, that was what the about. intent was yeah. about bringing in the community in different ways to be yeah. able to partner. So I think that is what you'll be seeing when we write, like similar to that, when we're writing up the, the actual action plan for initiative 5.2. Yeah, great. Um, but yeah, I just want to reiterate, but mm -hmm. I really do like the plan, so it was a great job. Great Thank work you. to everyone involved. Uh, Mr. Smaha, think you had. Next. Yeah, um, to, just to, to quickly go back to the 1.2 um, aspect um, of this, um, and just thinking about uh, when I read it, and I'm looking at appropriate levels of challenge, I think I actually really liked it, because I see it as something that applies across the range of student abilities. So it's where MTSS, I think, is like sort of broad range, tier one, tier two, tier three, whereas 1.2 is really looking at, um, you, know, you know, you use the data and you can group students, you know, in, in any 
reform do you want to? So it's looking at not just kids at the bottom and I need support, and not just the kids at the top who might need this extra challenge, but it's looking at those kids in the middle, right, that are sometimes sort of uh, <laughs> overlooked, I think, mm -hmm. in, a, in a lot of ways, and providing well, what is like the, you know, the, the next step for them? What is the next step for every kid all across the sort of spectrum um, of learning in different, you know, like mm -hmm. you're saying, like mm -hmm. in different areas? So I, I like how 1.2 is written, and I would not be in favor of merging that with, um, with 1.1. 1 .1. um, and the other thing that I wanted to just point out that, that you made me think of is I know at one point there was discussion of articulation agreements, sort of some of the dual enrollment things that, that occur in other, other high schools um, with college, and I, I think that that would fit in with I guess with in, in somewhere in five, um, I don't know, but I'd, I'd like to see that maybe pursued as well because that was a conversation I know that we had probably a year and a half or so um, ago. But just to throw that out there too. Thank you. I have a couple of thoughts. Um, I really like everything that's here, um, but es especially in light of the few things that are here, it makes me, by seeing some of the stuff that's here, it makes me feel that there are a few things missing as well. Um, and kind of like an example of this is that we have in Objective three, we have a section about where, which one is it here? Um, uh, where's the item about recruiting? Something I can't find though, <laughs> what I'm looking for. Uh, it's 3.3, second page. Uh, there we go, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm having trouble like, reading my own screen here. Uh, establishing ongoing pro uh, processes for recruiting, hiring, and retaining. Uh, and advancing diverse staff as well as educators with strong equity commitments. All right, great. Um, but there's nothing that talks about this idea more broadly. It's like that establishing process for recruiting, hiring, retaining, and advancing, you know, excellent educators and, you know, people who are just in general like high quality, like a broader view of how do we make sure that we retain the excellent staff that we have, that we recruit the best possible teachers, uh, and again, continue to advance them. Um, it seems it's it's great, you know, it's great, and obviously it belongs in that particular objective. Um, but it doesn't quite seem to capture the entire way that we should be thinking about um, about you know how how we retain, recruit, and advance our advance our staff. Um, I had a kind of a similar thought about providing professional development on culturally responsive practices uh, belong, absolutely belongs there. Um, but more broadly, it's like we should all be providing professional development in lots of different ways to help our educators improve their craft. And I know that, and I feel that, I think that is captured to some extent in, um, in what is it, in 1.3. Um, but it's not using the same language, which makes me not quite sure if we're talking about the same thing. Uh, data-based ongoing professional learning, opportunities for coaching support, implementation. I mean, it's it's kind of dancing around some of the ideas. So maybe that's what we mean by that. That like that's what we mean by you know professional development for uh, new instructional practices. But um, I, I would like maybe I guess clarification if that's um, kind of what we're what we're thinking along those lines. I mean, is that is just another way of saying that. We're going to give PD and coaching and support yeah, to and, people and new. Yeah, and we give PD and, and coaching now, so we want to enhance it and expand on it. So it wasn't, um, you know, I guess I, thinking back through the process, the themes that emerged is where we focused, right? And so the theme that emerged is that we need to really have a um, specific effort on ensuring that we're providing PD on culturally responsive instruction. So that got its own initiative, right, under that uh, in objective three. Um, as far as 1.3, what emerged was um, the a combination of 
the fact that um, we don't have the same that that we the conversation was around how effective coaching can be for professional development for educators because we don't have an early release day every Wednesday for time for staff to, be, to provide outside PD. So the, you, you've seen the presentations at the elementary level um, with um, Michelle Levesque and Melissa Betancourt, um, how they're coaching teachers through these data meetings, they're in classrooms coaching. That type of professional development is where we are seeing the greatest gain um, in, it's amazing the growth I've seen in the last two years because of that and they're spread really thin. So thinking about, um, you know, that if we know that that's the PD that's make, giving us the biggest bang for our buck, if you will, um, as opposed to, you know, nice to have workshops on this or that, which we have lots of those. Um, so that is really where that focus mm -hmm. is around, you know, leveraging the most effective, beneficial professional development opp opportunities for our staff. Uh, and then the the last the last thought I have, and this kind of um, piggybacks a little bit onto something that, that Mike was saying before about um, about objective one uh, talking about. So there's a um, reference in there to their you know their academic well it's their academic social emotional and behavioral needs, um, but like looking through the so looking through the you know the elements you know we have at the end so. We're going to monitor discipline and attendance for social and emotional and behavioral needs. Um, there's more talk about, uh, so we also have um, SEL in uh, competencies and panorama data in 1.4. Um, so we just talked about 1.3. Um, and 1.2 is mostly, again, about like these tiered supports, or uh, rather 1.1. What, I don't know, there seems to be an academic aspect that's not here that, that I feel kind of needs to be there. And on, on one level, maybe it's one of these sort of like, well, that kind of goes without saying that like, you know, kids are supposed to learn. Um, but I, I, think, I think it should still be on some level front and center. In the previous plan, that was in fact the first objective. It was a, it was a student learning strategic objective. And, you know, we've, you know, we've kind of broadened that in the way we, that we've expressed um, uh, objective one here. But I don't know, I think that there's a, at a certain level, it's like we still need to make sure that there is, uh, you know, just a real focus on just the fundamental kind of the, you know, sort of like blocking and tackling, to use the football metaphor, of just teaching and learning. It's just like, are we focused on making sure that our kids are successfully learning the material that they're supposed to be learning? Um, and it's somehow not quite captured here, that we have high academic expectations uh, for our students and are going to measure ourselves to some degree on the fact that they are, in fact, mastering these skills and learning this material that we're, that we're teaching them. So what you're describing is exactly MTSS, but I think maybe this language isn't, right. isn't as clear for someone who's not invested, involved, in, or doing this every day, because what you've just, this is, that's why it's 1.1. It is the biggest component of um, really making sure, like, you know, we are looking at teaching and learning almost at like a microscopic level through this process of MTSS for co tier, um, tier one, which is our core instruction to ensure that it's vertically aligned, it's consistent, it's rigorous, it's evidence-based. That's what we're doing with tier one. Tier two is when that's not working for all students, we are, what evidence-based practices can we add to that student as a supplemental intervention to make sure they are getting what they need to be achieving at the highest level they can and then again level three so I think it really does encompass the academic piece I just think that maybe the wording isn't really appropriate necessarily maybe the the language in this initiative becomes more explicit in the action plan but that the wording on the front on the initiative part is more um, maybe we change it to make it a little bit more um, using the terms you know academic um, or whatever however we decide to put it but maybe that's where the disconnect is because as I hear these comments I'm hearing them over and over and in my head I'm like that's what we're doing that's exactly what this is about um, but understanding now after hearing all the feedback that it maybe it's not spelled out enough here 
for and this. And that may hold true with 1.32. I mean, I think so. That is good feedback, and I agree with you. Mm -hmm. So that's probably something we can take back and reconsider. Maybe a reframing of these or a rewording of some mm -hmm. of these. Yeah, I think I, I think it's important to clarify some of that um, because this is a. I mean, not that people are going to spend a lot of time looking at it, but this is like the strategic plan for your school district is something that you should, as an ordinary parent, be able to look at and, and yeah. feel that you kind of understand what the priorities are and what the district thinks is important and what they're what they're working on. Right. And I think that, and, and of course, this is true even of us on the kind of in the school committee is a little bit more immersed in some of the education jargon mm -hmm. and uh, right. and. You know, but not, but you know, but but not all of it. I mean, I, <laughs> it's like because it's like I mean, I basically understand. You know, we've talked about it many times about what MTSS is, and yet I wouldn't have kind of made that connection mm -hmm. to say, but uh, th that that's the same thing that I'm yeah. talking about. I see the way that you describe it that um, that it's yeah. that, that to you that's exactly what it is, and of course now you know I can I can see it through that lens. Um, but uh, but right, but I think it needs to be clearer mm -hmm. to someone without that kind of background what you know Correct. what we mean by that. Uh, Mr. Turner. Uh, I have an. I, th I think this can fall under an action plan request. Um, with regard to, to objective two, and it talks about foster school communities where student, all students and staff experience a sense of belonging. Below that, the one place that does touch on staff is 2.1, but all the rest of it talks about students, which is an appropriate focus. But it, with regard to 2.1 and and the staff, can one of the pieces specific one or, or more specifically target an action plan towards? The staff component of that objective, and really making sure we we do focus on their sense of belonging and safety within the schools, and and, and being part of the community in, in that that regard. We can take a look at that. Yep. Sorry. Yep. <clears throat> Any other comments? I think. All right. <laughs> Okay. I think I think we're good. Thank you. <laughs> on, uh, I'm still trying to get over the comment that you said that no one would be looking at this plan. People will. <laughs> <laughs> if you watch this recording back, I may have given you a look at that moment. <laughs> what? <laughs> we put all this work? No. They were Perhaps we can make a suggestion that it goes into every handbook. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, you know, your next email blast. I know, yeah. Going out to the whole district. Every, is, uh, every email blast at the bottom. <laughs> at the bottom. Yeah. A long footer. Um, all right, so I guess we are actually back to the agenda at this point. Uh, all right, so uh, one more item of new business, but this should be quick. Uh, calendar adjustment for the Wildwood. Thank you. Uh, it seemed appropriate to bring back to, your to you as a committee and your attention, given the fact that uh, the calendar is obviously something that you take action on to vote. Um, modification specifically to the Wildwood School as we look ahead to the fall of 2023-24 school year. To spend a lot of time taking a look at specifically the construction that will be uh, soon underway at the middle school, of which the intent will be to provide you with a brief update of that at the next meeting, uh, which I have to remember to do. But uh, it, we, we're, we're confident in the construction schedule um, that we have been told should be able to be very doable, but we do think that it would be appropriate to make a couple of slight adjustments to the Wildwood, which we tried to capture here. And again, it has to do with the calendar. Um, as you know, and has now been communicated to our Wildwood families, uh, the last day of school for uh, for these young youngsters is this Friday, uh, June the 16th. Uh, that frees up the, a full day on the 20th of June after the uh, long, the holiday weekend is coming up uh, for staff to be able to pack. Uh, many many staff again will be moving for what is the third time for some uh, in a very short window of time, of a year and a half. That's already been communicated. Uh, I don't see any need for any action on your part uh, for that. But um, the uh, one uh, adjustment for the calendar you can see is uh, the very beginning of September when we come back. We do think that it would be wise to provide a little bit more time and latitude just in case there's a little bit more time for the construction completion to happen. So the adjustment that you can see there uh, is that um, the orientation for students would be moved to the September 5th. Um, I'm sorry, to the 6th. It's getting late. First day is the 6th. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, so you can see that the adjustments there, it's a slight adjustment only, but we did, um, again, want to bring this back to you because you voted a calendar that doesn't reflect that right now. Um, the other thing to bring to your attention uh, does have to do um, with, uh, no, we don't have to talk about that. Um, but balancing out the days of instruction for, <laughs> uh, be between the Boutwell and the Wildwood next we'll year. We'll that with the strategic plan. We have a plan for that. and. Um, I thought it was in here. Where did it go? It's about the voting. It's about the voting. It's the presidential election, election right? Yeah. The presidential the primary. primary. Thank you. Wasn't that in this memo? It was. It, it well, was. I picked up on it. Okay. No, because I, I, I picked off hard copies, and I'm sorry, I didn't have it with me. I apologize. <laughs> Once again. All right, we're all getting loopy. We're gonna bring no, this. So it's March 5th, the to presidential what, primary. Whatever the memo said. <laughs> Can I? Yeah, there's sorry. that. Fine. Can I ask, do you, because we voted for the calendar, do you want, do we need to make a motion to approve this? We have to amend it. I, I, right? I would suggest that that would be appropriate. Yes. All right. So in but that before, oh Mr. Turner, go ahead. Just quickly, construction is a funny thing. Do we have a, I mean, I understand adding a day and that gives them a full week to move in, but is there contingency planning? You know, if they strike oil when they're going for that restroom or whatever. <laughs> You know, where suddenly New they can't get there, you know, I mean, is there contingency? I mean, it uh, makes me nervous considering it's just that little I, summer window to get this all done. There really, there really is. We've been given no sense of any concerns with the overall, uh, the, the bulk of the work for that construction in that um, the con contractor is ready to go, as we understand it, in that there's not perceived to be any delays because there's no... Um, you know, uh, I'm not sure how to, but you know, sophisticated equipment that's going to have to be uh, uh, called for. If there is any delay in the finishing mm. of the space, it would be. It's anticipated that it could be in the hallway mm. um, and/or in the restroom itself. Uh, but that would not, we don't believe, at this point in time, impede the ability to access and occupy that space. I think maybe we've talked about this before. At the worst case, maybe there's a little more time needed for the completion of the restroom. But that is envisioned to be a couple of days at best. So I don't see any issue right now. Now, if something drastically changes, we'll have to adjust and we'll bring you into the loop on that. Um, but we, we feel confident with what we've been given right now for timetabling that this should be fine. Ms. Burns. Um, Superintendent Brand, if you could just speak about how the Botwell will be closed for the presidential primaries on March 5th and what remediation um, to make up that day, because while we'll will be in session so i know that i had asked you that question but i think it might be helpful to Tip yeah thank you um so typically as as many know uh on voting days both in the past both the wildwood and and the boutwell have been closed they have been voting sites um the wildwood no longer will be a voting site of course its presence in the west and the and the middle school um, so what we believe to be an appropriate approach is still to continue with the closing of boutwell on voting days um, but uh, we are able to keep the Wildwood open. And this adjustment from the very beginning of the year next year for the, what we were just talking about, that will have a, a difference between the two schools, but that will be equalized come voting day when the Wildwood will still be able to be in session at the West and the Middle School. So. Thank you. So again, right. seeking your vote, I think it would be appropriate to have you. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the revised calendar? Motion by Mr. Fennelly. Oh. Second by Mr. Smaha. All in favor? And that is unanimous. All right, Jesse, take us through <laughs> public. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, public comment. We have uh, no public comment uh, in our packet. There is no one that has signed up for public comment. We did receive one earlier during the Dorn Whittier presentation. Would anybody like to make a public comment? It's over. All right. Uh, subcommittee reports. Do we have any subcommittee reports? Ms. Burns. Um, I just wanted to report out as um, MSA, uh, MASC officer that, um, as most of you may know, uh, registration for the uh, November joint conference between MASC and MASS um, is now open. Um, the uh, do want to let you know that it's being held again in what used to be called the Hyannis Conference Center. It's now called the Emerald Resort Cape Cod Irish Village. So um, so I do want to let you know. 
I do want to let you know um, that it, the, uh, the notification from MASC, which uh, Tracy was kind enough to share with you, um, uh, directs you to a link to, to reserve a room. Um, they have the, those rooms blocked, so you can't reserve it online. You have to call. So just a little, because uh, I've already made my reservation. <laughs> <laughs> really? The day it came out. I, I did, because I want a room, well, you know. So, um, but anyway, I just wanted to bring it to your attention. And um, there's an early bird special going on until July 14th. So um, you may want to think about it, save the district some money if you, I, I suggest everyone going this year. It was a very good event last year. It was. Thank you. Uh, any other subcommittee reports? Uh, any correspondence? None, thank you. All right, future dates, uh, June 15th, the uh, middle school moving on ceremony at the town common. Uh, one that's not on here, but I'm gonna mention anyway, June 19th, an important date. Uh, superintendent evaluation forms um, are due, so please have those uh, in by June 19th. Uh, June 20th, last day of um, the school year. Hard to believe we're all we're two and a half days of school left. Uh, June 27th, uh, Social Emotional Summer Learning Workshop. June 28th is our next regular session meeting uh, over, over Zoom, right, which will be held over Zoom. Uh, and then <laughs> reaching way in the front, uh, August 30th, 2023, 11 weeks from today, will be the start of the 23-24 school year. Um, just to let you know, August 28th is our first uh, school committee back for the, next, for the new year as well. Uh, it's August 23rd? 23rd, I, I have it written down as the 23rd. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, and August 23rd Thank will be you. our, uh, our um, first 23 24 school year meeting. All right, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> Second. Right, motion by Mr. Turner, seconded by Mrs. Burns. All in favor? We are out of here. Good night, everyone. Thank you.